morning. Are we on? Good morning. I'd like to make a quick announcement for those of you who are wondering why it's 11.07 we haven't quite started yet. So a couple things. Uh, a lot of people that were planning on coming and will be here are on the tour. And the tour is just wrapping up, so we didn't want to start without them. Okay. And then the second thing, now here I'm going to sit down and we're going to tell you why you don't need to sit down. The second thing is that um, the, the, we're starting these four sessions with prayer, and we have a, a special opportunity for a much more interactive and, and uh, one that's going to take place outside. And so as soon as the group gets here, uh, we're going to try and go to the blessing, and then we'll actually get started with the rest of the meeting. So if you, coffee, tea, whatever, if you could just hang tight for a few minutes, we'll, we'll get underway soon, all right? Thank you.
All right, so uh, plan, plan B, since they're just arriving, it's, it's basically the working group members who had a chance to have a, a meeting this morning and, and look at some of the collection. Rather than having everyone come in here to tell them to go outside, which would just waste time, we're all gonna go outside now to this little patio here for the blessing. So if I could get everyone, sorry, uh, to make their way there, that would be great. It's a beautiful day, and my heart is happy that we're having a gathering like this. Uh, as we all know, um, there is important work to be done, and we have a responsibility to care for our ancestors, keep their memory and their spirits in a good place. Uh, and so, um, in that regard, it's important to offer prayer important to begin any kind of gathering with prayer. So I'd invite you all to join in uh, this very brief, uh, short uh, prayer time. Of course, uh, you can participate if you choose. You can uh, participate and pray in your own way, because I know everyone has their own traditions and different ways to pray. So again, um, it's an honor that I've been asked to help with this blessing. I also then am asking permission of um, all of the elders and of our ancestors to be able to offer this prayer in a good way. So um, again, welcome, Nihuan. And uh, I do acknowledge, of course, that uh, we are gathering here in a place that people have lived for countless generations. We wish to um, acknowledge all of the Serrano and Luceno and Tongva and Kawia people who have called this place home for many thousands of years. And we are going to be talking about some of uh, their physical remains and also uh, articles that were used for prayer and ceremony. I think that it's important for us to treat uh, these items with the utmost of respect and honor. And so that means that our work has to be done in a very respectful and very deliberate way, very uh, dedicated way. We know that <clears throat> not all of the answers will be found in one day, but we will make progress today. So that's the intention of our prayer this morning. So again, um, I will pass uh, first some sage uh, smoke around to help us to uh, settle our hearts, minds, spirits. Uh, sage is a medicine used by most of the native peoples and uh, it has the healing quality of purification and so we want to let go of anything that troubles us and uh, it can be used in a medicinal way as well. If you want to make a tea, it will help to purify uh, your body as well. And, but today we will be focusing on purifying ourselves uh, emotionally and spiritually. So I'll do that and then we'll uh, have a short prayer and sing a, a couple of bird songs, which is a traditional way of beginning a gathering.
no, not with that thing. I will ask you a question. Oh, loving Creator, we ask your blessings. We ask that you help us to be good to one another. Give us uh, love and respect, and help us to remember to always honor one another, to always honor those who came before us and those who will follow. We pray for strength. We pray for guidance. We pray for healing, for humility. We pray for connection. We ask you to be at peace with one another. May that peace be upon us as we are gathered today and as we remember our ancestors. We pray for all who have lived here in this place. We pray for all of uh, their children that uh, we will always be uh, remembering them. We will always be respectful of them. That we will do our best to care for the things that they have used and left behind for us to learn from. We also ask that their spirits be at peace and that we always uh, show love and respect for their remains as we talk about the policies for caring for the physical remains of our ancestors we ask that they will guide us we ask again for the healing for things to be set right and for us to have the courage and strength to make sure that this work is completed and so again we say Nasun Achama, no Shun Lovik. We thank you so much, O loving Creator, Amna Ah. We ask you to watch over and guide this gathering today to bless all of your children here and those who are far away. We ask you to keep us uh, united in that good way of care and love for one another. Hey. Oh. And we'll sing, uh, we'll sing a couple of bird songs, which is a way of uh, celebrating community and a way of remembering the blessings of our Creator. The beautiful earth that uh, we have as our home, uh, who uh, the earth is a being, a family member, a relative, and so we thank our mother, the earth, for giving us all that we need for life. And so my nephew, uh, William, will help uh, to guide some songs, and uh, we'll, we'll be...
talked to my wife. <laughs> and everyone is invited to dance, so don't be shy. Gathering together as people, Kamakia, Kamakia. Makia, Makia, wa, e 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 Makia. Makiawa, he makia 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 makiawa.
Achima, Achima, no shun lovik. Thank you, everyone. Good morning. How is everyone? Uh, what a wonderful way to start the day. Um, thank you so much for doing that for us. I was glad to see a few people dancing at least. I, I wanted to, but I was too embarrassed. I'm sorry. <laughs> Saw a lot of people rocking in place, though. 
Michael Brown was putting some moves on, I think, there. It's, uh, it's a little, you were paying attention. Um, my name is Lewis Michelson, and I have the privilege and honor of facilitating the four working sessions that we're having on this subject. Um, the agenda is in front of you, so you already have an idea of, of where we're going today. Um, just be aware that we are live streaming the event. That's why you see the cameras. And fortunately, they were able to capture the prayer and the singing as well today. So that was uh, very lucky for us. What that means is that by entering this room, you've consented to be filmed or otherwise recorded. Uh, you may notice where the cameras are. They're both on this side. So generally speaking, you all are going to be seen. And those of you sitting over here will be seen much less but heard. Um, if you want to be seen and heard, then you would want to move over to one of the places over there. Although I think I've warned everybody, and I think they chose to be there. Um, so for what that's worth. Um, we are providing, as you saw, some, some very basic uh, refreshments at the beginning. There is a, a real live lunch that we're going to have, uh, and it will arrive relatively soon. <coughs> so as far as the agenda here, we're going to go ahead and take the opening remarks from several different individuals. And then by then, we probably will want to break for lunch and you know, keep it short so we can get back for really the, what I consider the main event, which is the rest of the afternoon, which is an opportunity to hear from all of you about the very important issues that, that we have to discuss today. So with that, I'd like to invite Chancellor Kim Wilcox to come up and start us off. We at UCR would like to respectfully acknowledge and recognize our responsibility to the original and current caretakers of this land, water, and air, the Cahuilla, the Seno, Serrano, and Tongva peoples, and all of their ancestors and descendants, past, present, and future. Today, this meeting place is home to many indigenous peoples from all over the world, including UCR faculty, staff, and students, and we gratefully appreciate the opportunity to live and work on these homelands. That's our acknowledgement statement at the university. We're proud of. We're, we regret that we haven't had it for decades, but only for months and years. But today, there are some words in this statement that resonate for me. All of their ancestors and descendants, past, present, and future. Humans, as we are, tend to live in the present. And we think about, I look around the room at so many great relationships I have with members of this room, and we think about what we are doing in this moment in time. Uh, we don't spend enough time, arguably, reflecting on those descendants, past, present, and future. What they have done to allow us to be here, and what they have done to make us who we are and what we are. And if there's a regret nationally, and in our university and our campus, it's, it's our relationship with native peoples, indigenous peoples here in California. Um, in the moment, again, I'm looking at some of my dear friends in the room. Uh, we feel here in Riverside we've made some progress, but there's much work to do, as Michael said earlier. I think the University of California has made some progress, but there's much work to do. And the extent to which our campus and our university can help the nation think about the work to do, uh, we are optimistic. Um, today is a day when you can't move together unless you work together. And I am so grateful for all of you to come here and be part of this conversation so that we can craft policies and practices that are optimal and don't leave our forebear, our descendants rather, in the same position of regret. So thank you very much for your willingness to come and participate. A special thank you to Ch Chairman Macaro for his leadership throughout this process. And thanks so much for being here today. And I regret that I can't be here all day. I have a lunch commitment I, I can't break. Uh, but I'll be watching this process closely uh, as it proceeds. So thank you very much. And it's my great honor, although I forgot it, <laughs> to introduce the uh, provost and vice president of the University of California, Michael Brown, who has been working closely with President Napolitano on the entire issue of NAGPRA and how we 
we readjust our practices in the, in the university. So Michael Brown. Before I begin, I, I just want to say I, I thank Chancellor Wilcox for his acknowledgement of the, of the history of this land that we're on and honoring the peoples, um, um, past, present, and future, um, uh, who are directly associated with this land. So thank you for those words. And actually, I'd like a copy of them if I, if I could. Uh, a good morning uh, to all, all of you in attendance and also to those who are uh, with us uh, live streaming as well. Uh, um, and, and thank you for your hearts and your minds as we engage in an, an important conversation here today. Um, uh, here at the University of California, uh, we are intent on creating change. And the President, uh, Janet Napolitano, has made this abundantly clear to me. Um, uh, and it's, it's, a, it's a charge that I, I, um, I embrace in my heart as well. The relationship between the university and California tribes is one uh, that the president and I deeply value. Uh, we fully acknowledge that this relationship has been fraught in the past. Uh, but that does not have to be our future. We are committed to improving that relationship, uh, not just in words. Uh, there's been many of those over the years. Um, but we want those to be shown in deeds as well. Last summer uh, in Sacramento, uh, President Napolitano attended a gathering where uh, Governor Newsom formally apologized uh, um, for uh, the California government's policy of genocide against Native people, uh, family separations, and forced servitude. It was an, an, well, I think it was an extraordinary moment, but it was also an important moment. And the actions he's taken, such as establishing uh, a Native American Truth and Healing Council, are critical steps uh, in addressing the wrongs that have been committed. We recognize uh, right now um, uh, deeply the often tragic context in which Native American ancestors and, and the items that belong to them and their peoples were removed from their burial locations, uh, often without the consent of descendant communities. The President and I have listened and heard, and we acknowledge the questions, comments, and concerns that have arisen from not just only outside of the university and from Native American peoples, but also from inside the university as well, um, and certainly our policymakers uh, in the state uh, regarding the university's policies and practices. Uh, and processes uh, with respect to how we have cared for those uh, uh, remains and artifacts, how we have and have not repatriated them, and, uh, and how those remains and artifacts have been uh, uh, deposed. Uh, comments have included concerns about differences among the campuses, uh, regarding how they've implemented approaches uh, with respect to repatriation. Am I? Okay. Uh, uh, the timeliness of the repatriation process and whether policies uh, reflect the most recent regulatory requirements, as well as whether there has been appropriate consideration of tribal viewpoints. As a result of these comments uh, and concerns, the President has explicitly stated and directed the campuses to adhere to the following core principle. The University of California fundamentally values repatriation of human remains of Native American ancestors and cultural items. 
This is new. Uh, and going forward, this will be the fundamental aims of our policy. And we are committed uh, to repatriating uh, these items, uh, these ancestors, in a timely manner. The ancestors must be respected and allowed to be laid to rest with dignity. Importantly, while the ancestors are in our care, while cultural items are in our care, uh, we may be stewards of these items, but they do not belong to us. Stewardship does not mean ownership. In 2018, the president established uh, the Native American Advisory Council, and I see members uh, here today uh, who are part of that council. The council is comprised of members of, from both federally recognized and non-federally recognized tribes who represent geographically diverse areas, sizes, and economic resources. The council advises the president and me on a broad range of issues including not only the treatment of human remains uh, of Native American ancestors and their uh, cultural items, but also such issues as educational access and student retention on our campuses. As a first order of business, we asked the council to nominate members uh, to serve on the Cultural Affiliation and Repatriation uh, Policy Advisory Work Group, uh, many of whom are here. This policy work group, uh, and this, this is a new practice for the university, never done before, uh, was charged with conducting a substantive review and revision of the university's uh, NAGPRA policies, uh, committee structures, and implementation practices. This effort was not only designed to line up with AB 2836, but to align with the values and principles of the university. Uh, tribal chairs and vice chairs, Mark Mercaro, Val Lopez, and, uh, and Dino Beltran, I, I know uh, Chairman Mercaro is here, I, I saw him earlier, um, and, and noted uh, archaeologist, uh, archaeologist uh, Desiree Martinez. All from the Native American Advisory Council were nominated to serve on that policy work group. And they were joined by Carol Goldberg, uh, who I, I saw as, as well, uh, Amy Lone Tree, and Beth uh, Piato, uh, and Angela Riley, who were nominated by the UC Academic Senate. I am thankful to have uh, many of those members here. The policy work group has been working through a number of components uh, of the revised system-wide policy. Uh, which was last updated back in 2001. I believe we've made great strides, uh, including a policy that now contains a clear purpose, vision, and guiding principles that prioritize repatriation as a fundamental objective and value. But you know and I know that the proof will be in the pudding when, when this policy, once we finalize it, gets put in place, uh, we want to see action that follows. Uh, the policy uh, will require, uh, among many things, the reconstitution of the system-wide committee uh, and the campus committees uh, on, on repatriation to include equal representation of Native American and UC representation. And a shift, and uh, in a shift from past practice, uh, that it will allow repatriation and cultural affiliation decisions to be approved at the campus level. This will eliminate the need for the system-wide committee and the University of California Office of the President to review campus determinations that are favorable to the tribe. Uh, and so that the system-wide committee can concentrate on those, uh, on issues of consistency across the campus, on system-wide guidance and oversight and appeals. The draft policy requires the appointment of a campus repatriation coordinator uh, to work with the Native American tribes to facilitate 
repatriation. And it mandates uh, repatriation implementation plans with specific goals and timelines. Importantly, the draft policy requires that campuses proactively, not just reactively, uh, review previous unreported holdings that may potentially uh, contain Native American human remains uh, or cultural items, and reevaluate previous determinations of culturally unidentifiable human remains in consultation with Native American tribes. The work group has included mandatory tribal consultation and tribal approval for access to human remains for any uh, permitted research, uh, instruction, exhibition, or other purposes. Without those permissions, the policy will not allow those things to continue. Yet, with all of this work, much more work remains ahead of us. We believe in an iterative process uh, that involves real exchange uh, with those most directly uh, uh, impacted by the policy. Uh, and, and that is critical for any future success with respect to repatriation. Therefore, uh, and this is from the president, although we had a January 1 uh, statutory deadline, at the request of the Native American Heritage Commission, uh, the policy work group, and uh, the president decided to extend the issuance of the final policy in order to engage in a meaningful discussion with California Native American tribes about the revised policy. We have therefore arranged for four work sessions to take place throughout the state in order to gain additional feedback from you on the policy. Uh, what was it, last week we had a meeting in, in um, at Berkeley, uh, and today is here in, in Riverside. We will have a February 14th session at UC Santa Barbara, and a Ver February 22nd session at UC Davis. It is important uh, that the tribal representatives uh, in attendance have the appropriate time and consideration to ensure that their viewpoints are heard and a productive uh, dialogue ensues. Uh, in addition to the work sessions uh, and in order to allow uh, uh, for individual tribal leaders to discuss the policy with UC leadership, uh, we've set aside time uh, for one-on-one -on -one conversations to take place. We did that at Berkeley. We did that this morning here as well. Uh, if you are interested in pursuing uh, one of these sessions uh, in, in the future, uh, please uh, let me know, let my staff know. Uh, Lourdes D'Amato is here. Uh, but anyone from UC, just let them know. They'll, they'll bubble it up uh, to where it needs to go. Uh, in addition to the one-on-one and the work sessions that are underway, uh, we have also set up a website. Is it? Yes. Um, uh, where you can access the draft policy and submit your comments and feedback. There's also an email address, uh, physical address, phone number listed on the website if you prefer any of those means to provide your input. President Napolitano has asked us to take action so that we can issue a final policy uh, by July 31st. Uh, 2020. So now because of UC then internal processes and timelines that have to happen to make that happen, uh, well, we will actually need to have our next draft completed uh, by mid-March. So following these work sessions, uh, the work group will work through all of the feedback and comments uh, through the end of February to produce uh, the near final uh, uh, draft of the policy. But let me emphasize, we will review and consider all feedback and comments. I look forward to a productive conversation today. I believe with your help, uh, we can get to the finish line with something that's better than what we've had up till now. 
and with that, let me turn it over uh, to one of our policy work group uh, members, uh, Chairman Mark Macaro, who is tribal chairman of the Pachanga Band of Lucino Indians. Thank you very much. May you, Yam. Actually, for another couple of minutes, it still is morning. And, Lova Kapiva Aona Eva Upum Esh, non non Mukara, non Pichanga, which he Pum Toshna Kati. So, um, it's really good to be here with all of you this morning. Uh, my name is Mark Makara, and as, he, as Provost Brown said, uh, I, I'm the tribal chairman for the Pichanga people, the Pichanga Band of Lusenyu Indians, uh, 43 driving miles to the south uh, in Temecula. Um, so welcome. Um, this is our second of four. Now, I, I, I know these are called workshops, but on the tribal side of things, these are consultations. These, these uh, meetings uh, on four successive Fridays or Saturdays are, uh, they are Indian Country's opportunity to provide comment to the work that this uh, committee, advisory committee and uh, work group uh, have been doing. Um, so first off, let me thank, I would like to thank uh, President Napolitano, uh, our president of the uh, University of California for engaging this process. Um, Faithfully, uh, one of her um, admonishments uh, to us uh, and, and, and pronouncements really is, is that this should be an iterative, iterative process. And um, I take that to mean uh, what you might understand that to mean, hopefully. It's a process that is, uh, calculates a desired result uh, by means of a repeated cycle of operations uh, like these successive uh, consultation sessions that we're doing. Uh, so an iterative process should be convergent and it should come closer to the desired result as the number of iterations increases. So I'm hoping that uh, includes uh, the tribal side and the UC side working together uh, for a common purpose and a common goal. Uh, it hasn't been easy. Uh, the interests of, of the University of California uh, in maintaining the status quo uh, has been uh, difficult in dealing with. Um, long entrenched, decades long, even over a century long uh, um, period of time where the university has really exercised its will over the ancestral collections. And, um, you know, case in point is, is why Assembly Bill 2836 was passed to begin with, because NAGPRA, the federal law, was passed in 1990, and um, it's been 30 years of flouting NAGPRA uh, as a university. Now, there have been pockets, bright spots, of uh, pockets of goodwill and great work, uh, largely due to um, lots of good people at certain campuses that have been able to, in spite of um, the, uh, the researchers that want to hang on to our, our ancestors' remains, uh, they've been able to wrangle uh, away and, and, and faithfully execute uh, elements of NAGPRA over the last 30 years. Um, but by and large, the system itself uh, is one that allows the cheat to continue. In my opening remarks at Berkeley, I specifically mentioned that uh, you know, the first one was, was appropriate for us to be at Berkeley because Berkeley has long been an academic den of iniquity when it comes to compliance with NAGPRA. The immoral hanging on to of our ancestral remains uh, is staggering in its scope. Um, I thought, and I had assumed in coming to UC Riverside, that here's a campus that mostly has divested itself of, um, at least by inventory uh, reckoning, uh, has divested itself of, of many ancestral remains, is on the track to going to zero. But on the way between there and here, um, between Berkeley and here, uh, it has come to light, for instance, that a collection uh, that belonged to, a, a, I think, a, well, I'll just say a, 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 a former faculty member, uh, Herb Taylor, um, there's no secrets here, uh, found by his granddaughter, I believe, in a garage of, uh, among other things, ancestral remains. So it's shocking, 
but I'm not shocked because as we discussed a little bit earlier this morning, uh, this may be, in my, in my estimation, I think this may be the tip of an iceberg. I don't think this is going to be an isolated case. Um, around the time NAGPRA was, and here's why, around the time NAGPRA was, was signed into law in 1990, um, there was a group of, uh, of anthropologists and archaeologists, well, let's say archaeologists and anthropologists, that formed that was a, a reaction to, a reactionary uh, response to NAGPRA. These were archaeologists in the UC system, um, headed up by Clement Meehan at UCLA. They, the, uh, they formed the American Collection for the Protection, the American Committee for the Protection of Archaeological Collections. And uh, that is as insidious as it sounds. Uh, their goal was to preserve and hang on to ancestral remains into perpetuity uh, to, among other things, uh, take advantage of technological advances in academia to further study uh, or further uh, make gains in their respective fields. And so I think what we're going to find is we're going to find that there are collections um, in garages and in home offices of deceased professors uh, and practitioners in the field that, that had their professional tenures under the UC banner. And as they, as they pass into the dustbins of history, the, their family members or other, other friends that come across these boxes, uh, la labeled or mislabeled, in the case of Irv Taylor, labeled something, what was the label? It didn't say human remains. Um, I think it said animal bones or so, faunal remains, I think it said. Yeah, faunal remains. Uh, th this is going to be encountered. We know that, I know that many of the bad actors that I alluded to in my opening remarks in Berkeley um, were out of Berkeley. Uh, but they're system-wide, let's, let's be clear here. I know that ACPAC was headed up, as I mentioned, by a fellow from UCLA, uh, and some of, the, some of his adherents in this uh, cult of, of preserving uh, ancestral remains into perpetuity came out of here at UC Riverside. I won't name them now, but I, w many, many of you who are uh, subject matter experts in the field, you know who they are, and we know who they are. So I'm expecting that over the next few years, this is go there are going to be more of these. What I'm getting to is that I think we need, in the short time we have, to promulgate this, re this new policy the University of California in particular needs to take responsibility for its faculty that are deceased and that are uh, retired or they're emeritus, maybe they're still alive, who, who did these things and, 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 and we need to account for these. These things are off rad radar currently, they are, they are off inventory, um, they need to be brought in. Uh, maybe we even need to identify them. I, I could come up with my own short list. I don't even practice in the field, but uh, based on our experience with some of these folks down in Temecula as development has occurred down there, and, and proactively uh, reach out and say, hey, you know, there's a possibility that uh, your grandfather's garage contains boxes uh, that we need and the tribes need so that they can reinter their ancestors. So uh, as we go about this, policy discussion and development today, from last week and over uh, at Santa Barbara and Berkeley, um, I think we will be submitting remarks that, that I hope deal with this, because this is, we, we, will, we will not have fulfilled the purposes, and I mean that's the collective we, we will not have uh, fulfilled the purposes of NAGPRA if we don't account for this. Having been apprised of this circumstance, we now have an obligation and responsibility to deal with it and deal with it correctly. A uh, couple other remarks I want want to make about the process is that um, we have, I think there was a mention of timelines. Um, timelines are important. Um, they're important like any, any deadline for a term paper is. Um, but uh, in this case, uh, timelines should never replace doing the right thing. And uh, um, I, I think uh, President Napolitano uh, clearly saw that this was important, even though we reached a legislatively determined timeline in AB 2836 of December 31, um, she correctly opted not to promulgate a draft policy, which would have required all of this, consultation and discussion and workshops, to come up with a actual working policy to then review a second round uh, of 
doing this all over again. So I'm glad we didn't do that. We can be uh, productive here and, 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 and expect that what we comment on collectively uh, will, will help shape that policy. So we need, to, we need to do that. And I'm putting that out there as a marker right now that um, I will be advocating that if we reach a point where it's either promulgation of a half-baked policy or in, but meet a timeline versus uh, putting out a good policy product, uh, I will be arguing and dying on the hill of putting out a good product. So that's where I'm at, and I think many of you are as well. I also want to say, you know, for my tribe, it's, it's very important uh, that, that these things be done right. There's a lot at stake. Our ancestors, our ancestral remains, uh, the remains of our ancestors and their fu associated funerary items, absolutely uh, important that these be dealt with and uh, equilibrium reestablished in our worldview. Um, you know, our worldview, uh, according to our Payomko people, our Lusenyu people, is that the world was created at Echvat Temeku. And uh, standing here as we are uh, on the UC Riverside campus, you know, there's a river that flows through Riverside. Uh, hence, I think, its name, Riverside. Um, in our language, in our culture, we have a name for the Santa Ana River in our language. It's Wanaona. And that's the name of our, of our river, Wanaona, of the Santa Ana River. All these area mountains, the big ones, uh, have names in our language. Hidekupa and Pumpelebo uh, is Mount Baldy and Cucamonga Mountain. I think they're in that direction right now, from where I'm standing. Um, uh, Piwipwi is San Gorgonio. Yamiva is, is uh, Mount San Jacinto. And uh, out in the west is um, uh, Kalaupa, that's uh, Saddleback Mountain. Uh, these are, are, are they're sentinels of thousands of years of our existence here. Um, I won't go into the details of this. I think I said it last time, but you know, our word for bison, for instance, is, is Uchanat. Uchanat is the Pleistocene bison because there have been no bison on this landscape since. And, um, uh, but they're here. They're, the paleontologists dig below 20 feet and they begin finding bison remains. Uh, and, and those bison are in our songs. So uh, we, I just want to put out that we have a long tenure on this land, as I think nearly every tribe in California does. And we have uh, cultural, religious, ancestral knowledge um, that if people are willing to listen, uh, can help guide these discussions. Um, so it's very important that, that that be done. I think just to close, I want to put forth that uh, you know, we're in this together. You know, our interest is that we need to have the university come out uh, with not, not with something that's pretty good. There's that commercial that deals with something that's just, you know, that doctor walks in the room and you know he's what is he? He's okay now or he's pretty good now? We need we need to shoot higher. We need something that that does right by by tribes and by our ancestors. So I'm hearing a lot of the, a lot of similar stuff uh, on the UC side of things, and you know I. I I'm encouraged, uh, we want to be positive, and we're in this together. So our, our interest is to, is to help everybody reach the same finish line at the same time with the same product. That, I think, is symbolic and indicative of the year we're in, 2020, uh, the clarity of vision that this year represents. So I won't belabor that, uh, that, um, that analogy or symbol, but uh, it is powerful. Um, so. Let's get through today. Let's make the most of our time here, and then we'll go on to my uh, undergrad alma mater at UC Santa Barbara for next week. So thank you very much. So um, the timing is such that uh, I believe lunch is here. Is that correct? So what I'd just like to cover quickly is a couple of things. We've made our way through the first four items here. And, and while my name appears up here in five and seven, uh, yeah, five and seven, I'm going to do as little talking as possible. My main job here is to listen uh, and to make sure that all of you get the opportunity to speak uh, for whatever length and, and subject matter that's important to you. Um, we are going to break for lunch here in just a second. I wanted to point out that in addition to information on how to submit comments, how to get in touch with information on the website. If you look at your agenda, that website address is there as well. You'll also see one for YouTube. Uh, while these are being live streamed, 
They're also being recorded so that people can see them afterwards. Um, I got a question earlier about are all four being live streamed? My current state of knowledge is that only the first two have the technology to do that. Um, so I just wanted to clarify that as far as we know, the, the next two will not be live streamed. And um, ground rules, I just want to go over this before we, we break. Um, I think the most important thing, and, and thank you everyone who kicked us off, I think we've been given our charge really clearly what we need to do today. Um, but it's important that we, while we're talking issues and that while we're talking details, that we also speak from the heart. Um, listening is probably the most underrated communication skill there is. And so there's different ways to listen. There's listening to argue, listening to debate, uh, but there's also listening to understand, and I, I think that's what we heard in the, in the prayer this morning as well, is that we need to listen to each other to understand where the other is coming from. Um, everything's open. All, all perspectives are valued, so I, I really hope you don't hold back if you've got a chance to look at the live stream from um, the recording from Berkeley. I think you will see we covered a lot of things, but that doesn't mean we covered everything. Um, simply speaking, attack the problem, respect the person. We've talked a lot about respect today. Uh, my job is to make sure that everyone has the opportunity to participate. I'm going to work really hard at that, okay? And then just whatever you can do to help us stay on track, whatever you think that track is, so we make as efficient use of all of your time that you're so generously giving us today. So with that, um, we are going to take a break for lunch. Uh, we would like to do it well, but as quickly as we can, so we can get back here and get to the really important stuff as soon as we can, all right? So is it, was it put in that, I, did, I didn't get to say, okay, there's another courtyard on the other side of this one uh, where the lunch is set up. Let's try and take 30 to no more than 40 minutes, if that's okay, so we can get back here and get going. Thank you, everyone. This is, this is a student break time. I understand you, there's supposed to be time for a student break. This is it. <laughs> Some of the people, our students here, you know, who are volunteering doing this kind of work. Is there enough so that they can have lunch yeah. too? Okay, I'm going to let them know, okay? Yeah, yeah. Maybe they can just go to the end or let the. Yeah. So I was told, student.
Oh, I made a mess of that. Damn it. Oh well. I'm the one that have to sit in it. Good afternoon. Uh, we're ready to get rolling. So thank you for everybody for doing that so expeditiously. So a few things to facilitate today. Um, I would just wanted to point out that we're in, in front of you. Uh, and a couple other people I just wanted to quickly introduce. Uh, we found out from the, from the Berkeley session that there were a couple of people who were kind of on point for the better part of the, the session uh, who, uh, from the UC that were involved in a lot of questions or responding or whatever that uh, required. So I just wanted to point them out as well. Uh, one is Lourdes de Matos. You want to raise your hand? Okay, right there. You'll probably hear from her again. And the other is Tim Miller, who is going to both be heard from and run around with one of the mics. Uh, we determined it's too hard to get by people over there, or we're going to do our best. We may, might have one on the outside, one on the inside. And uh, in order to keep it moving, they're, they're going to come to you and get to you really quickly uh, so that we have as little, little dead space as possible. But that way, we'll also get a good recording of what everyone has to say on, on the record for this. Um, another thing I want to point out real quickly is this form. Uh, we didn't have this for the first one. We have it for this one now, which makes sense. It's a way of providing a comment. Um, obviously, there's going to be other ways to submit written, written comments. But also, I, I think by my count, probably 90% close to that of the participants at the Berkeley session did speak, did have something to say. If for whatever reason um, you want to have something, feedback that you'd rather put in writing, put it on here. And if for whatever reason you would like it to be heard, but would prefer not to have to say it out loud. Um, if you want to hand me one of those at one of the breaks, I'll be happy to read it for you. So we just want to make sure everybody has as many ways to participate as they're, as they're comfortable doing. And then finally, um, this was a tool created. This is also in front of you. Uh, it requires a, a, a little bit of explanation. Uh, we've got a better legend now. What you see are a number of topic areas that were identified um, in the comments that have been received through a variety of means uh, since the original draft policy was put out. And you probably also know, but if you don't, there's already a new version, version two, I think it's being called, of the policy that was put out, is available on the website that, that um, outlines changes to the policy that the university already recognized from the feedback they were getting made sense to already commit to. And, and, and so those can be reviewed by you. You can say, is, did that go far enough? Did that get what we were trying to get at? Um, you'll also see in the yellow, those are the areas that, that on that issue, whatever that issue was, that they're still working on it. They're still not quite sure. They, they for sure know they need more feedback from you on. So if you get a chance to review that, that'll give you an idea of, oh, they really need some help on this one. I think I, I can provide some input that would do that. But in addition to that, we're not limited to these issues, OK? These, these are the issues that, that have already been identified from early comments that, that they know they need to work on. That does not mean they are all the issues that they need to work on. In fact, I think Mark already introduced at least one, if not two, um, that really aren't reflected in, in here in, in any um, direct or perhaps meaningful way. I also told Mark I really appreciate him being able to be the one that kicks us off with the last comments, because he makes it really clear that nothing's off the table, uh, that the time is short. There's no reason to hold back. Uh, there's no reason to not speak your mind. Um, and that's what we're hoping we can continue to promote for the rest of the afternoon. So the afternoon is really yours and, and however you want to, to start. So if there's any general comments that anyone would like to make about um, the policies, uh, or your objectives, or the challenge, or your hopes or expectations, we can start there. Or if there's something in this list of, I think it's 15 issues, that strikes your fancy. So there's the mic, and there's Mark. Thanks. Uh, yeah, just real quick as we dive in here. Uh, I, I do want to underscore that uh, this is a process comment about how we go about this business of uh, receiving comments. That. Uh, 
as you were starting to say, if something's already been stated, um, but you feel like you need to state or make a statement about it, uh, please continue. Um, and even today, if, 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 if an issue has been raised, um, it doesn't mean it can't be raised again by uh, another individual, another tribe. Uh, and, and I want to emphasize that because sometimes it's the same subject matter or the same uh, content or the same issue uh, is con has a context that is uh, specific to a region or specific to a tribe's material culture or religion that uh, on the surface may look like the same issue in the north, for instance, but in the south has different consequences and ramifications. So um, encourage, if you have something to say, put it out there. And uh, you know we will document the origin and, uh, and 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 deal with the comment. So, but but having the source of it is very important to to us as we go through this process. So, and and you're, you. you're speaking on behalf of yourself and the working group. I assume. Yes. So, yes. I don't know that we properly identified who all those people were in the room. Can can those of you who are working with the working group raise your hands just so people know where you are? So we've got uh, a pretty good representation here. Okay. Thank you. All right. So, um, what would anyone like to talk about? What do we need to know? What? We didn't at the first one simply because there were so many people there. If you'd like to do that, we can certainly do that. So, can we start around the room? Of course, she's the one eating. You want to start around that side of the room since, no, no. Hi. Um, hello. It is. Hello. Hi, um, I'm Laura Miranda. I'm a member of the Pechanga tribe. I'm also the chair of the Native American Heritage Commission. Um, I'm glad to be here, and I'm here to also participate, but also hear um, what other tribal <coughs> communities' um, issues are as well. Thank you. And a UC graduate, UCLA, go Bruins. <laughs> Good afternoon, I'm Courtney Coyle. I'm here on behalf of United Auburn Indians. And um, I'm a lawyer, and I've been working in this area for about 25 years. Um, and I've worked with a number of the people in the room today. Um, my initial comment would just be, uh, I was not at the last meeting, but I did watch it on YouTube afterwards, and I found it was very, very useful, and I think an important record you had uh, tribal leaders and elders and practitioners providing record and comments that I think are really important. Um, so I'm glad today is being live streamed, but I would really encourage the folks who are managing this to live stream and record. I see some people nodding their heads, yes, live stream, and record the next two sessions as well. There has to be a way to make that technology work at the UC systems, because um, I think it is a valuable record. I see somebody from Berkeley shaking their head no. Um, but I think that it's very important that we have a record here and that the conversations are very important. So thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Carol Goldberg. I'm a member of the work group, uh, having been appointed as a representative of the Academic Senate. I am a uh, recently retired, longtime faculty member at the School of Law at UCLA. I was for many years UCLA's NAGPRA representative to the UC system-wide committee and chair of UCLA's NAGPRA committee. My specialty area in law is uh, federal Indian law and tribal law. I see um, a few former students in the room, actually. Um, and I just want to add that my own research interests have required undertaking empirical work that has involved um, interviewing um, tribal representatives and officials all throughout Indian country. And as part of that research, I have had to go through um, research protocols, human subjects protections that require, quite appropriately in my view, receiving permission from the tribes where we carry out this research. And I have said many times that in that regard, the research interests that I hold as a faculty researcher at the University of California align very closely with the repatriation interests of tribes throughout Indian country. Because if we go to permission to conduct our research 
And the University of California is known to be refusing to cooperate with the return of ancestors. That is going to impede our research. I mean, it's wrong for other reasons as well. But um, it's, in my view, inappropriate to juxtapose the research interests of the university with the repatriation interests of the tribe. There, that's true for some researchers, but not for all. So um, I just want to say that I've been very strongly supportive of uh, UCLA's own actions and was involved in the very uh, significant reburial that UCLA undertook um, a few years ago. Um, and I'm hoping that we can um, shift the policy UC system-wide in the direction of uh, ensuring that that kind of practice is throughout the University of California system. Thank you. I'm Randy Katz, the Vice Chancellor for Research at Berkeley and also the campus NAGPRA official. I was shaking my head no because it was unbelievable that we cannot live stream from any room on, on any one of our UC campuses. <laughs> we should, there should be a way to do that. I also want to make a, a commitment to Chairman Maccaro that uh, an admission that we have not done well in the past in terms of repatriation and uh, care of our Native Amer the Native American remains and artifacts that are in our, our current stewardship, uh, I make a commitment that we will do better. And I believe with the help of this process and the Native American community, we will. Good afternoon, Christine Victorino, Associate Chancellor and Chief of Staff at UC Riverside, mostly here to listen, to understand, as you've described. My name is Desiree Martinez. I'm Gabriela Otongva and also a member of the um, NAGPRA, NAGPRA subcommittee. And um, I'm making claim for all Tongva ancestors at Berkeley. Marisa McAuliffe, I work in President Napolitano's executive office, uh, also in a listening mode and, and um, helping Tim out with mic duties too. Good afternoon, I'm Jeff Krauss from the Office of Government and Community Relations here at UCR. Uh, I'm also the, uh, the, the primary staffer for the Chancellor's Native American Advisory Committee for the last 14 years. Um, my name is Alexander McCleary. I'm the tribal archaeologist for Sam and Well Band of Mission Indians. I'm also a um, long-standing UC grad student um, in the anthropology department at UC Berkeley. I hope to not be very soon. I hope to graduate this semester. And um, my, my hope is in implementing this policy that um, because it is UC-wide, campus-wide, that um, not only will all uh, professors and directors be held accountable to the law, um, but al that also all, um, all human remains and associated fudimary items, um, all NAGPRA and Cal-NAGPRA eligible items, um, will be accounted for, um, and the, the process will be um, applicable um, to uh, especially those individuals that are currently being held within um, educational um, collections that are you know stored away in in classrooms and drawers and might not have the visibility of being accessioned within the Phoebe Hearst Museum uh, for example or other museum uh, structures uh, in the UC system. Mihwen <coughs> woman. Nanito Mike Madrigal, Kawinga, Sobobanga. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Mike Madrigal, and uh, <clears throat> I'm a member of the Kawia Band of Indians. I also have ancestors in the uh, Payam Kuachim community. I grew up at the Saboba Reservation. And um, I just again want to uh, express that. This process of caring for our ancestors' remains and funerary objects is a spiritual process and that it is of utmost importance for the religious practice of our communities, and so we need to always keep that front and center. Atrima, thank you. May you yum. Notong Mark Makaro Yaka, and I'll just continue passing the mic at this point. Uh, I'm Alan Sweeney with the legal department at the Rincon Reservation. 
Good afternoon. I'm Anthony Madrigal. I'm also from the Cahuilla Band of Indians. I serve as uh, the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer for the Cahuilla Band. Um, and our, you know, our hope, uh, our tribe's hope is that you know, with this new policy um, that it can be implemented so our ancestors are always treated with respect and, uh, and repatriated. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Elizabeth Romero, and I serve as the Assistant Vice Chancellor of Governmental and Community Relations for campus. Um, interface uh, with the legislature quite a bit and our um, area communities. Uh, also from the Coachella Valley, and um, we have many tribes uh, who are our neighbors and, and uh, brothers and sisters in the community. So deep respect to, to the communities that um, are, you know, obviously where, where I live. So. I'm Lourdes DeMatos, and um, I work in the Office of the President under um, Provost Brown's um, leadership, and um, I am lead on this project, you know, um, and I'm really here to hear from you all what you think and to really um, understand where you're coming from so that we have a policy that addresses those issues. Thank you. Michael Brown, System Wide Provost. Hi, I'm Liz Holloma. I'm the Associate Vice Provost for Diversity and Engagement at UC Office of the President. And I uh, help organize these work sessions and also uh, staff the President's Native American Advisory Council. Hi, I'm Emily Olson. I'm the Tribal Archivist for the 29 Palm Band of Mission Indians in Coachella. Hello, I'm Lacey Padilla, and I work in the Tribal Historic Preservation Office for the Agua Caliente Band of Cahuilla Indians. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Travis Armstrong. I'm the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer and Archaeologist for Morongo Band. Mission Indians, uh, as many of you probably know, are uh, Cahuilla and Serrano Band. Um, also, just personally, I'm interested in hearing about the process of outreach to um, non-California tribes as an enrolled member of a tribe in the Midwest, uh, the UC system has remains from all over the country. I'm just kind of curious as we talk today how um, other tribes have been engaged as well. Hello everyone, my name is Jairo Avila. I'm the Tribal Historic and Cultural Preservation Officer for the Hernaneño Tatavian Band of Mission Indians. Hello, my name is Christina Gonzalez. I'm the Registrar Assistant Museum Director for Table Mountain Rancheria. I'm also Chumash. Hello, my name is Bob Pinnell. I'm the Cultural Resources Director for Table Mountain Rancheria in Central California. Christina and I work together. <clears throat> the Table Mountain Rancheria is one of the uh, five member tribes of uh, the Central California Yokut Nagpa Coalition. Uh, they've been organized for seven years now. Um, we've been very active mostly with UC Berkeley and more recently with UC Davis on Nagpa, and we've been active with UC Berkeley for over two decades. Mia Huen, Neneto, Teria Smith, Nehum Ipokam Tamingna. My name's Teria Smith. Um, I'm from Torres Martinez Reservation, or the east of here. <laughs> and um, I am a uh, editor for News from Native California Magazine, and also the California Indian Publishing Director for Heyday Books. And I serve on the UC President's Native American Advisory Committee. Um, I'm here primarily to listen and learn. Uh, NAGPRA is a, a pretty new subject as far as I'm concerned. And um, I'm interested to see how we can learn more and take back to my tribal community. And also to um, our, and give some information to our readers uh, across uh, tribes across California. Hello, my name is Cheryl Madrigal. I'm a member of the Palma Band of Luceno Indians, and I work for the Rincon Band of Luceno Indians as the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer and Cultural Resources Manager. Mia Huen Umu Emem, and at the William Madrigal Jr., Nakutunga Kawiai, Pacham Pacham. Welcome everyone to UC Riverside campus. Uh, I am a member of the Kuya Band of Indians and also a fourth year PhD student in Native American Studies here at UC Riverside. And also I've worked in cultural resources for the last 20 years, um, representative of my tribe and other tribes here in Southern California. And I'd just like to add real quick that uh, um, the realization that all of us California Indian people have a directive from our ancestors to do this type of work and uh, in the words of, of one of my late uh, elders and teachers is, um, Omo Icha, 
uh, uh, and what they were saying was that everything has value and that the ancestors need to be uh, preserved and they need to be considered and we need to do that in a good way and with, our good, with a good spirit, with a good heart. Thank you. Hi, my name is Megan Noble. I'm the NAGPRA project manager at UC Davis. I've been there since 2014. The decision at that point was made to um, change the respo NAGPRA responsibilities from the Anthropology Museum into the office of the provost, so I report directly to the provost. And I've also been helping as staff support for the work group to provide a campus perspective on some of the issues that have been considered. Hello, everyone, and good afternoon. My name is Cliff Trafser. I am a professor of history and I do Native American history here at UCR. I'm also the Rupert Costo chair, the present chair, and I serve on the, um, the statewide NAGPRA committee uh, from faculty to UCOP. I'm also on the, the uh, president's uh, council, and I am really pleased that we're all here today, that we're having these consultations. This is a real new thing. In the 30 years I've been within the UC, we haven't seen anything like that. We, um, we do have uh, here on our campus uh, a, a Chancellor's Native American Advisory Community uh, Committee that has been meeting since uh, 1989 and uh, continued in the 1990s and continues today. I'm glad that Jeff is here. He has uh, rounded us up. Uh, Michael and uh, Luke, the Madrigal family, has served on this committee for a number of years. And this, to me, is a, a real move forward uh, for the University of California and for Riverside. And I look forward to hearing more from uh, my colleagues, from all of you, about our collections here and how to do a better job at UCR in, in protecting the ancestors and returning them as soon as possible to their homeland. Hi everyone, I'm Christina Snyder. I am the Tribal Advisor for Governor Gavin Newsom and the Executive Secretary of the Native American Heritage Commission. And uh, my name is uh, Tim Miller and um, uh, my name is Tim Miller. I work with Lourdes um, at the UC Office of the President, um, and my role is obviously to listen to all of you. Um, part of what we do at the Office of the President is to support the Policy Advisory Workgroup, um, who you've heard of already um, in developing this policy. Great. So, what else do we want to talk about? Yeah, go ahead. Wait for the mic. Do you want to say something? Is, is somebody else's mic there? I no, I didn't see a hand. Go ahead. There's a mic. I was just going to start. Do I have to use this? Yeah. Oh, for the live stream. Okay. I was just going to sort of start in with some overall comments um, and viewpoints of, of the commission. And the commission did submit a lengthy comment letter on the last iteration of this policy. And I think one of the things, or a couple of overarching things that we really have a concern with is one, the actual process that is happening here. And thank you, Cliff, for putting that in perspective, that <laughs> this is probably the first time that there's been this kind of dedication to a tribal community issue. Um, but there is, um, a lack of understanding and a lack of, of understanding on behalf of the tribes and from the commission standpoint too of what is the process we're going to engage in giving comments and giving feedback and giving input into this policy and changes that we would like to see and things to improve it. But then where do those comments go? What are the decisions made behind the scenes, if you will, for what gets placed in the policy, what is um, rejected and not placed in the policy, and the decisions surrounding that. It's sort of basic components of like a due process um, sort of model of how this works. And um, I'm also, I'm not wearing this hat today, but I, I guess I can't really remove the knowledge that I have, but I'm a tribal lawyer. 
um, representing Pechanga, and I've also represented a number of tribes in the area of cultural resources protection for over 20 years and um, been involved in repatriation issues. So there is a vast amount of knowledge on the work group and in this room and from tribal folks. But unfortunately, the drafters that are putting pen to paper on this policy don't have that experience. And so it, it, it seems to be an impediment of how our comments actually make it onto the paper. Because even at the look at the second draft of the policy, it didn't incorporate all of the things the commission raised and all of the things I know were raised through other comment letters. And I don't know if that's because it's just, we don't know how to do that, how to actually form it and write it, or if they were just rejected. Because that is a very important piece here. Um, so I just wanted to raise that as like, can we understand what that process is and can, can then the tribes and the tribal communities have some assurance that sharing and putting time into this, you know, offering possible red lines to the document, offering new language is going to be received. Because everybody's talking about hearing each other and listening each other, to each other, but it's not just about listening. We can hear each other all day, we can say words, but it's about receiving it. And tribal consultation is about, oh, okay, you are coming from this perspective and you, um, you are asking for this. Um, can I, as the receiver of that, make that happen? And if I can't, why not? And then let's talk about that and have that iterative discussion about can we get to a place that is acceptable for, for the parties at the table. And I don't know that that kind of process is set up here. So I, I, that is you know, a, a major building block issue that tribes want to feel comfortable about going into consultations, that their information is going to actually be considered in a real way, and there's going to be a collaborative effort to try to reach agreement on all of these issues. Um, the other piece that is really lacking is just there is no timing. There are no time frames in this policy um, for you know, setting either policy goals on when we would like repatriation to be completed on the UC campuses system-wide. We, can we set a goal of you know, 2030 or something like that? Can we just do that? And it's not that, you know, Anything's, you know, nobody's going to be, you know, hauled off to prison if it doesn't happen, but it's an intention. And the tribes would really value that if there was some kind of goal setting in that regard. Because everybody's saying, we want repatriation to be the end result, but there's no time frame for it. This could drag on. And then within the policy for like the claims process and the disputes process, there's not a structured time frame for that. So things could linger on. Things could just drag on. And that is, you know, those are the sort of building blocks for how you would put together a policy that people would feel secure in and that they would, they would be able to know, have some certainty. Okay, if I'm going to make this claim, this is what I know is going to happen. And, and these are the parameters of it, and this is the time frame of it, and that's that is sort of that's lacking still in this policy. Um, the other piece um, that is really important is that in talking about, and and my chairman had raised um, this morning, you know, the the understanding of finding things and in, in garages of you know either retired professors or people who have left the university. There was a section in the previous draft about, um, you know, and I'm sorry, I'm just sort of going through my, my issues, but there was, and we can stop at any time if you guys want to talk about each one of these things. I didn't want to interrupt you, but yeah. I, I've already got like three and a half, and I, I just thought, if you can go again, but I think I'm already, I'm trying to. Oh, we have a track. time limit? No, 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 I'm saying we don't. You just you just offered up. Oh, okay. Do you wanna do you wanna get some feedback, or do you want or you wanna finish? It's up to you. Let me finish this okay. one, and then All we right. can go back if if All that right. makes sense. Sure. Um, sorry about that. Um, the third one is in the previous policy. There was um, a section about how uh, 
universities, each of the campuses would go through some sort of due diligence process to figure out, um, they would check with all the departments that could possibly have uh, human remains or um, skeletal remains and try to locate everything that could possibly be within the, the UC's uh, possession or I guess stewardship or um, their authority that they have control over. Um, and it's very important how we use those words, by the way, because um, that is another piece of here. Like, control is control. It means you have control over the items, whether they're actually physically on the campus or not. They, are they under the control of the university? There was a, a section about that, and now it's not there, or there's not, uh, there's not a replacement or a fix of the language. And so now, there isn't going to be uh, a, a re-inventory, uh, if you will, to look for things that may not be in the quote unquote either archaeological collections or where you would normally think they were. But we know from you know instances at other campuses and at UCLA, um, because um, I was involved in the same repatriation um, that um, Carol was talking about, that things can be in the dental school. Things can be anywhere that you know might potentially have human remains, and there needs to be a process to figure that out, um, and it needs to be system wide. It can't be left up to the campuses. Um, it has to be the system wide uh, policy that's consistent, so all the tribes know what they're dealing with at each campus. So I'll, I'll stop there for now. So um, in the order in which I think I heard them, if I missed one, let me know. I think one of the obvious ones was, what is for this particular process that we're going through over the next few months, how is that going to proceed? What's going to happen to their comments? Is, can someone give them some clarification on that? So Mike to Lourdes, if we could. Yeah. I think we said more about that for some reason at the first one, and I, you're right, I didn't hear it as much at this Thank one. you, Laura. Thank you for all your comments. Um, so with regard to the process, I'll start there. Um, what we will be doing is taking all of your comments. I think um, what is really missing and where I keep hearing over and over again, I just haven't had time to do it, is to um, give feedback on all the comments that were received in round one. I have that, I just haven't completed it. So I understand that I need to get that out there <laughs> so that you can see what the university reaction was to comments on the version one policy, um, as well as comments on that we are receiving throughout these sessions and through any other format that we receive comments on for version two. So, so they will receive a response that says how that was considered and what came about correct. why it was incorporated or not incorporated. Correct, okay. correct. Um, the other uh, piece of it is that we will take all of the comments that we're receiving through the end of February and the work group um, will go through all of the comments that we receive and try to um, see how we can incorporate them into the policy so that it reflects um, movement forward and addresses the concerns. So, because part of her question was about or wanting some assurance that it was people who had the experience, had the knowledge, had the ability to help UC interpret and understand those right. comments. And you're primarily going to be using the working group to help you with that aspect? Th that's correct. Okay. But we also um, will be going to leaning on the Native American Heritage Commission. And we have talked about that. And so um, okay. uh, our request is that we have some meetings with the Native American Heritage Commission okay. to sort of um, hammer out some of those, those areas. And that that will still need attention. Be taking place in early March, essentially. And well, Late February, we, early we have March. to set up the dates, but um, it has to happen before the next draft is completed. Can I, Mark, has something he wants to add to that? Yeah. Uh, do we have that chart that shows the uh, um, the meetings and and essentially the big picture between now and August first? I don't the, think we have it on the PowerPoint, unfortunately. Okay. I don't know if it's a timeline. It's a, like a schedule of milestones in this process. So it's a schedule of sorts. I don't know what actually we're calling that, but it shows the, it shows these four uh, workshop consultations. It yeah. shows, you know, then uh, I think academic senate review. Um, I don't know what else it shows after that. Some internal review, and then, you know, because right? is it on the oh, website? Oh, it's on the website. Okay, uh, right. Maybe maybe we can put that website up. Is there a way to pull that up? 
What it implies strongly is that um, we're supposed to be done with this process by the time that President Napolitano leaves office. So August 1st, July 31st, something like that. All right. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. So, so to so to follow up on what Gordis just said, um, I don't know. This is We're not hearing you. Okay. Let me see. It's on. Battery strong. Should be on that end then. It's on now. It's okay. Ready. There we go. Thank you. Um, so. I know we're under a tight timeline um, at at present, but is the intention after the work the work committee group meets again and goes through this and discussions with the Heritage Commission that then there would be like a third draft? I mean, because part of the iterative process is for tribes is to understand have we been heard, has the pen carried forward in the way that was intended? So I'm not trying to put more work on everybody, but in terms of the iterative process, I think that that would be smart to do because it seems like we're making progress, but I think we've taken out maybe some of the bad stuff, but we still haven't put in what I'll call the good stuff and the stuff that's really going to move the dial on the ground for the people that are actually implementing the policy. And I think it would be helpful, at least for the tribes that I work with, to have an understanding of what that is. And with the appendices, um, we don't even know what those are, and those make us kind of nervous because it's something we haven't even seen yet, and the flow charts, and we have a bad history in some ways with things happening in appendices that come later that then can undermine things. I'm not trying to cast aspersions, but it's based on just experience in, in this area. So I think we would feel most comfortable if we really knew what was going to be moving forward and are willing to participate in that process. So. Are we going to see like so, another draft or? So can we take the mic back to Lourdes? Yeah, I, because of how quickly this is moving and the process and trying to finish it before Janet Napolitano leaves, um, I believe some of these things are going to be done not consecutively but concurrently. And so, right, there's going to be another draft that's going to be reviewed. Go. Yes. Um, so um, after we, this is version two. We will be creating version three that will be posted on our website and um, we will invite comments from all tribal communities and from the UC communities at that point. So there'll be another opportunity to comment on version three. So it sounds like people need to know there is a timeline for that. There are steps in that. And, and is all of that that we've just discussed clearly on described in the website? I think so, yes. Okay. Tribes need the timeline. Mm -hmm. So something maybe more. They need the deadline. Okay. And what I'm hearing is maybe something a little more proactively than if you go on the website, you can find it. Okay. Um, the next one I heard was uh, something that I believe is missing, which are goals uh, with timelines. Yes. So can I address that? So um, the the goals, I, I think that that's a, a tough one and and one that I think will will require some discussion, but. Um, what we do have right now um, is for uh, a repatriation plan. Um, that plan, so each campus needs to come up with their plan. And within that, they need to um, define their goals for repatriation with set timelines and goals for when they'll complete 10%, 20%, 30% of the repatriation. Um, and the reason why we've done it that way so far is because each campus is very different. So for instance, at Berkeley, where there are um, many, many more human remains and cultural items, they will need to evaluate how it is that they can get to the end goal um, in a way that makes sense for that campus. Um, and uh, Randy Katz, you know, at the last time you, you mentioned that there might need to be like two sets of goals. One is what we can do with current resources and what we can do with more resources. Yeah. Does someone have a comment they want to make about what we're talking about right now? Yeah, if we could get the mic to them. I still got a couple more on the list to go to. I actually uh, had a comment about the first comments that were sure. made. Um, this is uh, Travis from Rongo. Um, we didn't submit uh, comment letters, but what I understand kind of offline in the 
California TIPO world is that there's been some concern that individual tribes' concerns were not addressed directly, that they went into this matrix, and the matrix may be not nuanced enough for specific concerns of the tribes, and we have this work session process, which is consultation, um, and these one-on-ones possible, but it's, it's a, a different animal than usually um, the TIPO officer usually deal with this consultation, which is government to government. You know, sometimes I might feel comfortable in this environment sharing certain things, and so it's kind of upending our normal consultation process, how this is going, and then there's a sort of somewhat fast track to it as well. And so my question is, going forward, is there opportunities for individual consultation, which you, you see, because normally everyone here is representing the tribe, but they're representing a different government, and needs to be kind of afforded that opportunity as well, but does that not fit into this fast track timeline? So I believe that came up at the Berkeley session, and kind of like two answers. One is, yes, there'll be further consultation, obviously, after the policy is adopted. The question is what individual consultation can take place before it's adopted, and I think Lourdes is up again. Did you give the mic to Lourdes? Uh, just keep it, thank you. <laughs> um, yes, um, if you want to have a one-on-one -on -one consultation with um, me or me and or the provost, um, please just let us know and we will make that happen. Okay. Um, anything else on that we want to go back to? Yes. Yeah, go ahead. I heard you say something about um, approval of the academic senate, and then I might have overheard something about national NAGPRA, and I don't see those things on the, on the milestone schedule, so just trying to understand if there's going to be issues, uh, how many layers of review are there, and like who's the final approver, I guess, for the UC might be helpful to understand as well. And are there other external places that UC thinks this policy needs to go even after maybe we come to agreement on everything? Um, I, <clears throat> Michael Brown, Assistant White Provost, uh, this is presidential policy, so at the end of the day, the president is the final approver of the policy. Um, uh, she's asked for a process that allows her to approve the final policy before she uh, leaves office. And uh, the goal for us is to en engineer all the layers of review so we can attain to that. So um, as I tried to indicate in my earlier remarks, um, uh, 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 we plan to, uh, after all of these sessions are completed, we plan to have by mid-March, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, the um, the third version, okay? So what you have in your packets are the second version redlined to show the changes that have taken place well, thus far. It wasn't well, in the packet. I don't have it. Oh, they don't have it? The, no. The, it's, um, what is here it's is, on the website. It's, it's anyway. a clean version, but in, on the website we have both a red line and a clean version. See, I had hoped they had seen. Uh, if you had seen the red line version that is on the website, you will see the, uh, the then original version with the changes. Uh, and so I, I think in this discussion, not seeing those changes, you don't even know how uh, the previous comments have been uh, taken uh, into consideration. It is true uh, that uh, one fault of the current process is that the individual comments that we have received, we haven't given individual responses back. Uh, we have chosen to emphasize making changes on the draft policy itself and showing that, um, but not to exclude the other one, it's just in terms of the resources we have, the focus was on changing the policy than on giving the individual feedback. But the plan is uh, to give the individual feedback to everyone who has um, uh, sent uh, feedback to us about how their concerns, how we think their concerns were addressed. And so, uh, and the goal is to have that uh, um, rec uh, received before the, th the third. 
Yeah. yeah, before the third, the third version. The third version is the version uh, that um, uh, will be submitted to uh, system-wide review by the Academic Senate. We are still working on. That's not what she said. She said we get to review. She's Lorda said we get to review the third version. So is it getting sent as a final version, or Everyone is there, will see is it there at that time. a consultation on the third review or the third? iteration, the third draft. It's, it's concurrent review, yeah. Yes. yes. So how does that work? What happens if we want to make changes or if Academic Senate makes changes that the tribes don't like or if things get done that are contrary to what we thought we agreed to in this process? I, um, one of the, the ways that uh, Chairman McCarl described this process, um, which I liked a lot, was a convergence process. Uh, uh, I, that at least I liked that. Excuse me. Uh, uh, he he said it was an iterative process, meaning we each are iterating with a goal of reaching agreement on those iterations like that's what he said not concurrent he didn't talk about concurrently well uh, w w what we've had thus far just to remind everybody Be was a a a process that um that involved um uh input um um uh, uh, by the um the drafting committee to craft a, a, a recommended policy. We have sent that out for comment. We received those comments. The red line version indicates what changes we've now incorporated from that original version. So that's part of uh, convergence. Um, that is what's being commented upon now. Uh, we are assembling comments on that, and that will be brought into the third version. The third version is what's going to go out for concurrent review. So uh, all interested part, I'm just describing what the process is. It, it, um, uh, uh, it, it will go through uh, the various layers of review. We will t assemble all of those comments in the final, okay? So it's that third version uh, which uh, represents, and I think we, it was described in our Berkeley session as the last bite of the apple, um, uh, that all the interested parties will have a chance to, to, to opine about. And our goal is to show all the changes at each stage of that process. What, what, I, what I heard her say, if I could just add, was that even after that, there are going to be different comments from all of the tribes. There are going to be comments from the Academic Senate. A new version is going to be created. And what if there is still, I'll just use the word dissatisfaction with that version because changes were made between the third and the fourth that still aren't acceptable to some people? That, that's what I heard as your question. And, and I, go ahead. I was wondering if you have a flow chart of that process. Yeah, that would be. That would help. That would help to have a flow chart. Um, but do you, do you hear what I'm saying? Is it like, at, at what point can well, you say you're done? Right. Well, I, I think we'll never be done if we keep, um, you know, uh, well, re-engaging. But yes, I, I we will be. I think I have described it. The, can you use the, the mic? The, yeah, the last version, the last bite of the apple is that third version. People will be able to give comment. That will be incorporated to the best of our uh, 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 ability in the final draft that the president will yeah, approve, no. but it won't go through another layer of review. Okay. Mark, did you have something? I thought I saw your hand. Yeah. Can you get in the mic? It's just yeah. a question for transition. I asked maybe other comments. Well, I just, um, I want to speak now in my capacity as a former chair of the Academic Senate at UCLA. Um, I, I think there may be perhaps a misapprehension about the role of academic senate review. The university has final authority over policies such as this. Um, 
there are other aspects of university governance that are allocated to the Academic Senate, mostly having to do with the review and establishment of academic programs. This isn't that, okay? So the Academic Senate is entitled to be consulted about this. The Academic Senate is entitled to offer up comments about it, but the university, I'm just being honest here, and I guess I'm a former vice chancellor, so I can wear both hats here. The university is not obligated to accept those comments or uh, recommendations from the academic senate. They're not binding on the campus. I mean, there could be po political fallout from it, certainly, and every university administrator has to be mindful of that, but um, there's no obligation. And, um, you know, I think it's really important that the academic senate review this uh, because if the process cuts them out, there is going to be resentment towards this policy regardless of how the content of it is viewed. The process will get people's, um, people upset. And these policies are going to be carried out by people who work for the University of California, um, many of whom are going to be faculty members. And I think doing this process is important, but with the understanding that the Academic Senate does not have any control over what this policy ultimately says. So, Anyone I see else? the provost nodding, so. Yeah. And yeah, I think you're a former Senate chair too, perhaps. Chair too. Can we get a mic over here? Um, I know we want to. Right I, I think that the thing I would like to say is uh, I understand uh, because of the history of the relationship between the academic community and the tribes, there is uh, worrisome concerns about the Senate part of the review. I will say that, uh, to be very clear and honest with you, uh, 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 they were commending the direction of this policy in their uh, first set of review. And I, I think the academic community is not the enemy of the process now that it has been in the past. Um, uh, and so, um, uh, but to, to speak to the factual um, uh, uh, description that Carol gave, it is true, uh, the term I would use is that they are not dispositive on this positive policy. It is an administrative policy, but um, uh, it does impact the academic community, and they should uh, opine and are. You were next. Yeah, I just had a question. I have some concerns regarding the, the deadlines with the drafts. Um, we were one of the bands who had submitted comments in November. None of us has heard back to our individual comments. So now we're asked to provide the second round of comments in February without even knowing what your response to our original comments were. Um, we, we are all on tight schedules, um, so I feel like I, I am doing another round of work um, not knowing what happened to my first comments, if they have already been rejected, um, do I have to provide more information? Um, and then the last draft, it seems like we don't even have a chance to bring any comments in before it's gonna be bumped up to the next layer of approval. I think that's very concerning since it's really not serving the consultation process. And I feel that the tribes need to have more time to review the policy and also have our comments heard and um, get a response from the committee um, what the, the stand is on our comments. Okay, anybody else wanna comment on that aspect? We, we had started to talk about goals and timelines of the actual fulfillment of the repatriation obligations and process. Um, I think the comment that we heard was that no one's going to go to jail, but it would be nice if, uh, if there were some. And the initial response was, well, it's going to have to be done campus by campus, and that they may look differently. I think that's where we left off, when, if we want to come back to that one, about goals or deadlines for the actual repatriation policy. Anybody have some thoughts on that? Over here, please. Um, I'm just not sure that there is a mechanism and at, at this point in the policy to understand whether 
the goals are being met. Once they're established, how are they met? Is there a reporting thing that has to happen that goes to the office of the president on an annual basis on this is where we're at? Is that going to be part of the repatriation plans or whatever the implementation plans are? It might be helpful to see a table of contents for what that plan might look like so then we can at least know where our issues plug in. Um, I mean, it seems like there's an impetus towards getting something approved before the president leaves, you know, and if that's the case, I'm not saying that, you know, there's enough time or not, and I'm not, you know, but maybe we can put some language in the policy that says once a new policy is final, that there can be a framework for check-in and update of that policy to see whether and how the new policy is actually working and whether campus and overall you, you see goals are actually being met to, uh, so, so we can be assured that the core principles of timeliness and accountability are happening. That kind of feedback loop, I don't think, is in the revised policy. Um, you know, I don't know that that fixes where we're at, feeling a little bit pressed for time now, but that might be one mechanism to give us some assurance that there's going to be a check-in if we didn't get it right the first time. There's a principle called adaptive management that says, besides your very best efforts at convergence, until you start implementing something, you don't always know what the in unintended consequences of that. So I think what you're suggesting is let's build in a mechanism to have that check in and see how well it's working, knowing that it won't be another 15 years before there's another revision to the policy. So, yeah. so I, right. I have a, a couple of comments on that. Um, one is that um, there are several places in the policy where the campus has to report to the campus committee and to the system-wide committee on uh, repatriations, on all claims that they've received on, on previously unreported findings. So there's various points in the policy where there is a required report to the committees. Um, we have not added that one, so thank you for um, um, highlighting the report on how are you doing on your goals, you know, specifically on your goals. I think that's very important, so um, thank you for that comment. Um, and the second um, thing that I want to address is that the campus committees and the system-wide committees are there for a purpose. They have an oversight role. Um, so they will be reviewing everything that's happening at the campus and providing uh, recommendations to the chancellor and to the president for changes. A policy uh, is is not meant to be for it forever in place, especially if it's not working. If it needs if it needs amending, then we will amend it. Right. But we can we can we can build into to the policy uh, some some check to review the entire policy. I mean that's not a that's not an unreasonable thing. I don't know exactly how to do it yet, but I've made a mental note, uh, well, not a mental note, a physical note uh, to, uh, to, I thought that was helpful. Uh, we'll, let's, let's see about incorporating that idea. Thank you. Um, but I think in terms of the reports on an annual basis, it shouldn't just be to the committees. It just shouldn't be an insular you see thing. I think there's, you know, a public accountability. You see a lot of tribes here today and at the first session statewide, it's an issue. They really care. So I think if we're really going towards the core principles of accountability, transparency, um, there needs to be a public part to that. I don't know exactly right. what it looks like, but. Totally makes sense. That's, that's all I was going to say, and I was going to offer that that could be an opportunity for collaboration with the Native American Heritage Commission as well. Mm -hmm. We could hold some sort of day long where the UC would then say, percentage-wise, this is how we've moved on repatriations, or this is what's been done over the last, you know, 12 months, 24 months, however long we're doing that, so that there is an open vetting and the tribes feel like there is some movement on what everybody is saying, we want to repatriate. Um, it, but if we don't see it, then, then we're not gonna understand that okay. that's happening. Agreed. All right, anything else on that? Uh, Mark, get him the mic, please. Just to... Uh, continue to belabor the issue of timeline, uh, because it is, it is important. So um, 
we, if I'm referencing the website. Thanks for the, the tip on the link and um, finally got signal to it. Um, it, it. On the page, it opens up with the link. Um, it, there's a section there that's labeled timeline. <laughs> so I guess that's what we're, what we're calling this product. It's, it says below is the expected timeline for final issuance of the policy. So uh, first up is a subheading of work sessions. So that's where we're at right now. We're in the second of four. Um, and then the next subheading says revise policy after work sessions. So this is where in, in your mail at UCOP, I think a few of us might get sucked into that as well. Um, it looks like a three-week time period between February 23rd and March 15th. Uh, it's revised work policy after works, revised policy after work sessions. And then the next subheading says comprehensive review phase, March 16th through June 14th. So that's a, uh, a three-month period there. And, um, and, and the text in that subheading says distribute policy version number three for comment from the California Native American Communities, comma, uh, the Native American Heritage Commission, and the UC community. So um, we were talking around that right there. Um, that's a three-month period. Um, it was mentioned that that's a concurrent process. Uh, so comments, I'm, I'm not sure how that's going to play out. It, I'm, I'm excited to know. <laughs> it, it sounds a bit challenging, but because that's where the rubber's really going to meet the road there. We, if we will have had version one, version two, which will be the product of this next two or three weeks, and then version three will be out there, and we'll all be making comments at the same time. And somehow, we're going to take the best of all those for, uh, well, I, I want to believe for Indian country, as well as, you know, you want to believe, of course, for the UC, uh, and hopefully those will be the one and the same. And in that three-month period, we will come out with, uh, I guess, a, a revised policy for comprehensive review on June 15th. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's a lot to fill in there, though, on, on, on what that process that's, is going to work. That's, that's where academic senate goes. Yes. Yes. That yes. Okay. yes. And, and we've done it once already with version one, where we received um, over 300 individual comments. Um, and so we have those in a matrix, and we, I will be publishing that, you know, as soon as I can to, um, to individually address each comment. I won't sleep for the next month, but I'll get it done. So it sounds like um, there's some detail on the t on the, about the timeline on the website, but I think the suggestion for a flow chart is something that might make that just a little bit easier to comprehend would be helpful. All right, so go ahead, Mike. Yeah, and uh, I think here I may be picking up on something that uh, Desiree raised earlier in our work group. Um, what about, this says um, during the comprehensive review phase, California Native American communities, the Heritage Commission, and the UC community. Um, haven't we also been talking about uh, reaching out, we heard this from one of the uh, TIPOs, uh, reaching out to uh, other tribal communities whose ancestors and uh, important objects may be part of UC Holdings? Are we going to reach out to them yes. too during this process? So we have a, a very long list of people that, we, that this invitation was sent to, and um, it includes people, uh, tribes outside of California that we know we have cultural affiliation, you know, with, that we have um, uh, items or remains that um, to which they're culturally affiliated. So we have also Im included them in the invitation, and they will be included again in the invitation to provide comments. Okay, so the, 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 Mike, the sorry. text is, a, no. The text is actually missing that. You might want to add it. Okay, thank you. All right. In, Mark. Yeah, sure. Um, and it's a, actually a clarification. I think, Laura, you, did you mention, because you mentioned a lot of things, that, uh, there, that in that time period, because I think that's a time period that I think what I heard you say, you said, uh, that there should be one day in there where, I don't know, we t I'll take a time out to see where we're at in that third in review of the third draft. Did you, did you say that? I, you, you need the mic to answer. Yeah, yeah you need the mic. When she mentioned that one day, I thought that was an, like an annual review when you were reviewing the policy in the future. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, OK. So that's, I think I got that right. Um, one other issue that was brought up when we, when we just went around and introduced ourselves, and I think it was raised again it was by one of you, I think, was where is the inventory or re-inventory, how or what's going to be in the policy about that, as well as how much are people going to be directed to look outside the obvious places where one might find these objects versus yes, the so less obvious places. That's um, now on page 25 of the policy, and we've I mean, retitled version, a it. A version two. A version two. Okay. We've called it previously unreported holdings. So we did not remove that. We just may have moved it around. Um, but yes, we will require an, um, a periodic review of outside of the traditional places where these things are normally held. Um, the, I'm talking about the cultural items and the human remains of the ancestors um, to make sure that uh, if we have anything in medical schools or other places that there be a review. Um, and if we do find those in those places that they be brought in. The, over here, Mike. Um, he said page 25. I'm just wondering. On the bottom. On the, oh, on the clean version. OK, which I don't have. Okay. Um, just to um, just ask a question, if it's not uh, in the, the policy already, who is going to do that inventory? I mean, so because I, I, what I'm worried about are, are people that don't necessarily have an interest in having things properly inventory. Right. We, we did hear that feedback. So if you um, think that we haven't covered it um, appropriately, please give, some, give us some feedback on that. But we've said um, um, by experts, example, osteologists, anthropologists, tribal leaders, et cetera. That's what we have in, in the policy now. If you think it's not appropriately covered, please let us know. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, I think ahead. there's a little bit more to it. And I think Chairman was on to something you know, how the UCs and the age of the UCs and some of the UC professors are coming upon retirement age and um, passing on. And I had a most unusual experience that I really never thought I would have when I was uh, at a place and I was told, um, well, don't look in the back closet of a home because there's a skeleton in, it, in there. And I'm like, you know, this is some kind of a joke, a skeleton in the closet, right? And I open up the cabinet and, or the room, at the door of the room, and it was this closet type thing. I was like, no, 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 it's around the side. And I opened up, it was awkward to try and open it, I opened it up, and there was this hanging human skeleton with teeth in it. Um, so I think what Chairman is saying, we are going to be finding more of this, and I just am hopeful that whatever the policy has reaches out to not just current faculty, but the emeritus and um, all those issues where these remains probably were found during their work for the universities and their affiliates. So I, I want to underscore that I think, even if you think you've got a clean situation at your campus now, um, you may not, and that's an experience that happened to me very recently, and it was very troubling. Thank you. Thank you for that. That's pretty appalling. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think I, I actually mentioned this to you earlier, Cliff, and, and that is the desirability of annual notices being sent around um, to all the faculty um, and possibly also to um, staff or um, postdocs, graduate students, whoever might be in this situation. And uh, don't just do it once, um, but this actually could be part of an annual circulation. But the relatives don't know what to do with these items. R right. I, I think it's um, important to acknowledge to the tribal representatives here um, that I, I certainly believe that the harboring of these collections by faculty is a violation of the faculty code of conduct. Um, this is something for which you could be disciplined. Um, I'm not sure exactly how threatening you want to be in this notice, but um, I, I, it, it should be clear to everyone here that this is not allowable. All right, you are next. Um, perhaps it would be a good idea to have some kind of uh, mechanism by which uh, members of the public 
um, graduate students, untenured professors, for example, um, who might be aware of literally where the bodies are hidden and feel like they aren't able, they're not empowered to take action. Perhaps mm. it would be a way of uh, doing like an anonymous tip off Amnesty to somewhere. Or yeah, something some kind of. So you can turn these in, nothing. Right, because. I think that that might make the process a lot more efficient as mm -hmm. well, as opposed to you know people who might not have affiliation, for example, might not have that institutional knowledge, knowledge of the politics of the of the department, might not know where to look, right? But others might have encountered them before anybody else has a, had a chance to hoard them or hide them in advance of an inspection, for example. One of the things we heard, Thank you. one word that I heard a lot at the Berkeley session was proactive, it was used by a lot of people, and I think. That's, that's maybe when you say the good stuff isn't in there yet, maybe it's, it's that, is that the proactive nature of some of the stuff maybe needs a little beefing up. Okay, I'm, in, I'm gonna be contrarian to that proactive language because that's exactly what it says in this section. And Lourdes, I, you might have moved it, but the commission made comments on how it needed to incorporate some kind of system-wide steps and not just say, Proactive efforts are required across UC. Each campus will communicate with all relevant faculty, researchers, and staff to raise awareness. But it doesn't have any like to do things and it doesn't get specific about what is supposed to happen. So in, in all in all, a campus could say, okay, yeah, we're gonna do that and they'll take a really minimal step and they'll be in compliance with this because they'll say we've made proactive efforts. The meat on the bone is how do you define proactive efforts and let's put something in here. We just had two great examples of, of some kind of real policy and steps and actions that could be written in here that would put meat on the bone to this, this language that's in this section which really just says, yeah, go look for things. And that's all it says. Um, we're looking for more. Because that's understood now. NAGPRA requires that now. This doesn't add anything to what the existing law is. So that's the kind of example where I think throughout this, at least from the commission's standpoint, that was where the, it's throughout here is lacking the actual meat on the bone. It's just the nice fluffy language. Um, using words like we're going to be proactive and we're going to look at this and we're going to raise awareness and we're going to we're going to um, you know tell you know the campus each campus is going to be responsible for following NAGPRA okay fine but how do we take this a step further and actually put the pieces in here that we know there's gonna be an annual letter that goes out or we know there's gonna be steps taken. Right, so um, I love hearing the concrete examples that you guys are providing. I think it's really extremely useful um, to us. So um, we will take that. Um, the other piece of it that I, I, I don't want us to forget is that there, there will be um, opportunities even as the policy is implemented, where the committees are gonna be finding these um, um, deficiencies, where they can rec make recommendations for improvements. And one of the things that my office does in particular is that we convene practitioners in all sorts of other areas, and we can convene the campuses on this area as well so that they have an opportunity to talk to each other and that they can, um, together, you know, we can lead that effort to come to have some consistency in how they approach these um, steps later. There's, I think we are, are trying to do the best we can to address all the major issues, but I know from experience that we will never have it 100%, um, but there are opportunities to um, improve that as we go through and as we, as we discover new issues, new hiccups as we go through the process. Um, our office will be involved in trying to resolve those with the committees. So, I think, so I think the, the thing I've taken from this conversation is the importance of, of, a, a, of a discovery mechanism. 
uh, by which um, uh, uh, faculty themselves can report, others who may know of remains and uh, repatriation artifacts, that, that there's a, a, mechan a proactive mechanism where those things can be identified and, uh, and, and reported. Uh, and I also take that um, uh, uh, that the importance of of a process of um, of of letting people know how uh, how we are doing in the repatriation process. I think that is I think that's very important. Uh, coupled with um, um, uh, not only a, an internal accountability, but a kind of a public accountability part to that. Uh, so, um, uh, and, I, and I think there's this other, and, and it's linked, both of those are, are linked to um, uh, the fact that there are uh, professors, or uh, obviously, uh, who may have um, uh, um, holdings uh, that they shouldn't hold. And, um, and annual notices is one way, uh, but maybe these reporting mechanisms uh, can be added to that as well. So I think those are worth us uh, uh, diving, diving into. Michael, I, I think I heard something a little, a little more overarching in addition to those specific things, which is, again, however great a job everyone does over the next several months of trying to get to the best policy possible that hopefully meets everyone's needs, um, that, that there's specific actions that will either make that implementation go or won't go. That'll either, you know, there's the words on the paper and then there's the actual actions that take place. And what I've heard, what I saw in the comments that were written and the comments I heard today and last week is this desire for specificity that doesn't allow someone to skirt or, or avoid that which is intended. What I've also heard is how much can you put in a policy document? So is there, are there any other mechanisms or any other documents or anything else besides the policy itself that's going to help guide the implementation over time, like guidance or I, I don't know, just is there, can you talk at all about what, what there is, what other structures or mechanisms are besides the policy itself that can help guide implementation? I, I, I will say, um, and, and um, uh, it is respecting the sensitivity of this area. This, this document that we've created now is actually far more an implementation guide than it is a policy document itself. Um, um, uh, um, uh, I, th I think uh, having, that's why it's how many pages? <laughs> um, uh, um, uh, uh, I think though that even in addition, um, to uh, this document when we finalize it, all the appendices which are supposed to, they're not supposed to be new policy and appendices, uh, I'm just going to say. And so nothing in appendices is supposed to counteract w with a policy. Um, uh, but I understand, having said that, I understand how not seeing the whole thing uh, in, an, in such an atmosphere of distrust is worrisome. I get it. I, I think I get that. So, um, um, uh, but, I th but what, let me say in short, in addition to whatever we finalize here, in addition to those appendices, which are supposed to be clarifying, not changing policy, there's still going to be a need for a guidance document um, uh, that will guide implementation. And um, because you just can't put every single uh, thing in, in a policy document. Um, uh, and that will, um, that will help us make this a more uh, lived out reality than just words on a page. I, you might want to say more about that. Uh, yes. Yeah, so our, our office is um, um, always involved in, in policy writing, and then we also issue guidance from the Office of the President. And I think that guidance that comes from the Office of the President is very meaningful um, and respected at the campuses. So to the extent that we need to issue post-issuance of the policy guidance that 
helps address certain areas where we've, we're seeing um, the, uh, the need for clarity or, or campuses need more guidance, then we will be issuing those. Actually, we had a comment over here. Um, I had just had a question maybe for clarification, how it works with the budget. So we're hearing all these like mechanisms that the UC wants to implement, um, working closer with tribes having inventories, um, like renewed inventories. Um, is it the committee that will also make suggestions or recommendations um, for new positions? How is this all funded? It seems like um, just for the UC Riverside, it would probably take 10 more people to be hired to go through that. And Phoebe Hurst with the large collection, it probably needs twice as many people. Okay. Um, so I'm just curious, is that something that comes out of the committee or where in the UC does this all come, how is this finance, all the great ideas that we have now? Can you clarify which committee you're referring to, the campus committee? Is that Both. What? Both committees. The campus committee, how do the campuses okay. deal with it? And okay. um, also for the UC White okay. system, um, with all the stuff that needs to be done, if we talk about yearly updates or even more frequently meetings with tribes, like who's going to facilitate that and who's that funded by? Like? Huge resource implications of all of that, absolutely. Right. Can we get the mic like, over there? Um, I just wanted to um, react a little bit to what I heard Provost say, which was um, about distrust. And I don't think it's necessarily all a distrust issue. I think that there's the issue of historical trauma and the ongoing, I'll call it psychological warfare that I've seen my clients be subject to when they've gone through these repatriation processes. That's the only word, I'm a non-Indian, but that's the only word that I can use to describe it, what I see. And it's really troubling, so I think it's more than just a distrust. Um, getting back to what Lourdes said on these guidance documents, you know, I don't know where that line is for policy versus guidance. I do totally see the need for detail and specificity because that's where we're getting tripped up on the implementation and I want to touch on that piece in a minute. But I just wanted to understand when you do these guidance documents, is there an opportunity for consultation with the affected communities on those guidance documents? Or maybe you guys haven't done this before with tribes, but maybe you have with other communities of interest. Because um, I think that if you're talking about detail and specificity, you would need to work with those communities to really have guidance that makes sense. We have not issued um, guidance of any, I don't think, of any sort that has, that is in this area where um, th this is a first, you know, for us to be um, um, creating university policy where there is um, tribal input or any external input I think is a first. I think it's, you know, um, uh, uh, very important that we do that. Yeah, I think it's it's the first time. So um, I, I think I want to say I don't know how we'll go forward, but I do want to uh, point out that the committees will be um, balanced with equal representation from both UC community and tribal representatives, which is a first, which is a first as well. And um, from what I've seen, if you, you, you see here the academic senate appointees to the work group. Um, are very uh, knowledgeable as to tribal issues. So what, Mike. So what you're saying is... Mike. So, so what I hear you saying is that there, since it hasn't happened before on these guidance documents, there would be an intention to take them back through... At the very least through the committees, at the very least. Yeah, so the guidance documents the guidance documents implement policy. Right, but so, I'm just trying to understand which committees. Are you saying the individual campus committees? Are you saying that this work group that's been convened, that they're going to continue no. operating after this policy? Or no. <laughs> no, the, Carol no, says they, no. They, they, both the system-wide um, uh, committees, uh, the system-wide committee, mm -hmm. uh, and the campus committees. Uh, are, will be responsible, and all personnel associated, repatriation coordinator, the chancellor themselves, uh, um, uh, will be responsible for the implementation of the policy. And so they will um, uh, uh, see these guidance documents, react to these guidance documents, make sure 
that they are aligned with the policy itself. Um, in this discussion about the guidance document, because um, I, I think there was a, an element to this uh, discussion that came up at, at our previous session in Berkeley. Um, I don't recall any statements that uh, were carved in stone or anything. Um, but I think for our purposes, what we ought to do, at least as, as a practical matter, stay ahead of the curve, um, is, is that uh, as we receive comments and suggestions from, uh, from these sessions, that um, um, we make a quick uh, uh, determination whether something uh, is, is included in mm -hmm. the policy document or, or the mm -hmm. uh, upcoming guidance document. And we just kind of collate and things that way or code it that way that we, if, if, in other words, we, if we think something's a guidance document issue, it's, it's so specific, but important, but specific, um, that rather than weeding it out of the policy document, that we actually hang on to it and, and have this queue of, of stuff for the guidance document. It'll put us ahead of the process um, because it will have been obtained through this product of workshops slash consultations. So I think that would be a, a practical and logical way for us to, to continue this process and capture these things as, as they're presented. The other thing is, um, I guess in terms of the uh, continuing the integrity of this process and ensuring that it gets done, um, I do know that, you know, there's a third party to our efforts here, right? And it's, it's the tribal communities, there's the UC, the third party is the state legislature. Um, the bill author, AB 2836, um, is actually, uh, well, I don't know exactly what they're doing right now. I know generally that they're working on a piece of draft legislation that, that extends the deadline that, um, that so, so that we can continue to lawfully or legally conduct the work that we're doing. Um, I would like to suggest here in this room as well as to uh, the bill's author and staff, anybody in, inside the, uh, the Capitol building that's involved with the redraft or the, amend the amendment of the bill extension vehicle, that perhaps we put a, uh, a, some language in there uh, in regards to a guidance document and some of the good points that have been, have been put here, uh, that such guidance document, because that's going to come after President Napolitano is, is gone. I said in the first meeting, by the way, that I'm concerned uh, um, about, you know, in, in that vacuum, who replaces President Napolitano? Will they have the same, uh, the same conviction and fervor about doing this and doing this right? Um, as President Napolitano has, uh, among all the checklist items that uh, goes on in a headhunt for a president of the UC, I'm not sure that, that NAGPRA uh, is high on that check, checklist. Uh, it should be. It should be in the top three. However, uh, I, I know better, and so uh, I think sometimes people need legislative incentives, and um, uh, so I, I'm going to be raising this um, with our friends in the state legislature to ensure that uh, the follow-through to this uh, policy effort uh, includes uh, appropriate measures in the guidance document so that uh, the tribal community is ensured that the follow-through is done and done well. And I'm not sure who, wh I don't know which team will be involved in, in, in the follow-through of the guidance document uh, to the extent that institutional memory is good for consistency. Uh, it would be good to have uh, most of us in the room continue this discussion. However, um, you know, much remains to be seen. But I, I just wanted to throw that out there, having heard a lot of this discussion about guidance document, because it's going to be really important. That's where the implementation will be, as Provost Brown has just said. So um, that's what I want to so, offer right now. So capture everything you can. Yeah. Rather than dismiss it as not being at the policy level. And get it into, get it into adoption, what can be by July 30th, but anticipate what comes after that and make sure that that has the follow through not knowing who the persons are going to be. Yeah, so okay. I just want to add a little bit of clarity to that. Um, we have three placeholders in the appendices to the um, um, policy document right now, and those are the process on summary process, how to um, submit claims for summary, how to submit claims for inventory that are in the inventories right now, and what the consultation process will look like. So at least those three pieces of what are more procedural type of actions will be as appendices to the policy. So what I'm talking about when I say guidance that 
um, it would, might be forthcoming is anything that we haven't captured and or that we haven't anticipated that comes later, issues that later arise. Um, so that's what my intention is here, at least, at least that's what <laughs> I was thinking, that we would try to capture as much as we could in the current Actually, policy. That's, that's the way we have proceeded is to make sure, even though we internal to the university normally make a distinction between policy and guidance, the way we've proceeded is as if that distinction doesn't exist. And so um, uh, that is why we have put as much as we have thus far and we'll, and we'll and, and, uh, continue to do so. And, and just to be clear, the three appendices that you mentioned, those will be part of version three and those will be reviewed as well? Correct. Okay. Um, I wasn't sure about that. Yes, go ahead, you're next. Um, with all that um, has just been said, uh, I think we do need to circle back a bit to the, the issue of the budget and yep. the... <laughs> <laughs> Because, uh, yeah, we just need, I and I think that does need to be dealt with as soon as possible, um, because otherwise none of this happens. Right. Right. So our intention is to get the law on the books first, <laughs> you know, um, so that we, we know what we're dealing with, and then um, the university will have to figure out how to do the next steps. Yeah, I, I just want to emphasize that the resources required to do the repatriation process right can be considerable. Um, and at UCLA, we have um, allocated funds not only for the staff who need to carry out the, the inventories, the checking of all the physical locales on campus, um, the um, establishment of uh, cultural affiliation, the uh, outreach and consultation with tribes, not just that. Um, sometimes because um, the current University of California policy has enabled uh, challenges on review when a campus wants to repatriate, we've had to hire researchers to um, counter uh, objections to repatriation that have come from members of the UC faculty at other campuses. Now, this is maybe 10 or 15 years ago. I like to think it's gotten better than that. but. I'm not sure. Um, so we wound up investing in um, cultural anthropologists and other experts who could help us counter some of these objections. And then when it came time for the reburial of ancestors, UCLA invested resources in under, underwriting the cost of those reburials, which I can tell you was not trivial. Um, but we thought it was important enough we provided the resources for those purposes. Every campus is going to have to do something comparable to that and to the extent they haven't done it. Their other programs have been carried out on the backs of repatriation work that should have been done and wasn't. Carol, can you clarify in the case of UCLA, um, were those just discretionary funds that were able to be used as opposed to funds that were budgeted for that type all of All of the money is discretionary in a sense. The campus has to budget it for various purposes. We were working uh, very specifically with the vice chancellor for research who either had to have that money in his budget, and it was a he, or um, had to go back to the chancellor and say, find it, right? Or to request it for the next budget. So, um, and it, it, was, it was a struggle. It wasn't simple. It required the, um, frankly, relentless pursuit by our curator of archeology, span and I was uh, privileged to be able to support her in those requests because I was chair of our campus committee. But, that has not happened on every campus. Now, you know, how much to be budgeted on each campus is going to be widely debated, but there are benchmarks. There are best practices or better practices. You can look to institutions that have comparable holdings that are doing a good job um, and see what kinds of budgets they're allocating 
for that purpose. Or you can take a budget like the one we had and extrapolate from it to what would be required if the campus had more or less to be repatriated. And, and, it's, and, it's, not, it's not impossible. No, it, it's not impossible. What, what I think I'm hearing is, wouldn't it be nice if it was budgeted for and didn't require relentless effort mm -hmm. to, to basically beg that it be stolen from somewhere else, right? That's Oh, yeah, that's a great world. I mean, I mean I, that's, <laughs> what, what I'm saying is that's a great world. I, I'm hearing the, the bar raised about what resources allocation needs to look like for this. There, there isn't a lot of understanding within universities about this. Yeah. Um, we had to do a you know, relentless pursuit because we had to explain it. Once we explained it, they, you know, they grudgingly found the money. Um, but it took a lot. Carol, you're being very modest because that would not have happened if we didn't have Carol in the, as a vice chancellor of the university to have an ally at a position like that. That would have never happened on the UCLA campus in combination with having Wendy Teeter as a, 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 a very passionate advocate to achieve repatriation at that campus. This was completely person, human driven, I'm sorry to say. I mean, I, like, I guess from the perspective of having built in structures in the university, in the UC, but this was all because of these certain humans that were willing to put in a ton of time and, and, and not back off until it was achieved. And I don't know that that exists in all of these, at all of these campuses. Um, so that's why the system-wide policy, that's why we need that, those specific pieces. And I don't know that there's, this is a policy, so can we have language in here about budgeting and about budgeting goals? Because I don't see that commitment in here to back up this, because quite honestly, they're just going to say, it's, it's not going to be a matter of let's get the policy done and then it'll just all magically happen. Everybody will say, well, this is nice, but we don't have the funding. And then who's going to advocate for it? Because nobody's really obligated to advocate for it. So then it comes back to the tribes again to go start this process again. And maybe another piece of legislation has to go in. And it just feels circular. She, if I could just uh, take a moment to acknowledge um, the work of, of Carol and, and Wendy. I uh, really appreciate it. I wish there were more people like you in the world. Um, short of, and I don't want to interrupt uh, where you were going with that, that Laura, but um, perhaps uh, because this is such uncharted territory, and not to give you more work, but maybe Carol, you can uh, draft some kind of <laughs> guideline, <laughs> right, about how, how, or you know, just give a history of how you did allocate those resources so that, you know, if there are, do happen to be, in an absence of any other effort, kind-hearted and dedicated um, people within the UC system, you know, to, uh, to help them to, you know, uh, repeat your efforts. I mean, that I was just going to say that the Berkeley collection is on the size of the Smithsonian. That's what we're talking about. So you can look at the model of the Smithsonian to what they had dedicated for their repatriation. I mean, there are models out, that's what we're talking about. This is of that size and magnitude that you have to create a department and you have to be committed to put the funding to creating a department that large to, um, to repatriate 9,200 sets of human remains at Berkeley, of which 86% are now deemed culturally unaffiliated, 86%. That's a ton of work. Like that, and on that level, we're talking, you know, that's the model to look at for what you're gonna fund is look at the Smithsonian. Okay, I've got like five hands up right now. I'm gonna cry and take them in the order in which I saw them. So you would be next. Yeah, I just wanted to go on the budget part and what happens if it isn't funded somehow by the university is the tribes end up having to do that. And that happens to tribes on projects now under CEQA and NEPA and uh, the NHPA. And some of these costs can be huge for the tribes. And that's taking away money that the tribal government would have used for other tribal services. So it isn't like this is a cost-free type of an issue. And you know it almost 
feels like you know a reparation mm -hmm. of sorts and something that really gets the healing going and makes up just a little bit for the trauma and the psychological warfare mm. that I talked about earlier. That's a real tangible thing. And um, it's salt in the wounds for the tribes, right? Well, yes, you have this obligation to go and take care of your ancestors and their belongings. Oh, and by the way, you get to absorb the cost for doing that. You know, how, how often are like the tribal people the only people in the room who aren't getting paid? Most of the time, right? So I think that there's an issue with that that really needs to be dealt with that I think will do a lot with making tribes feel welcome. You talk about tribal people not feeling welcome on UC campuses or they don't stay at the university once they're there. I mean, I think this all kind of rolls up together. You know, there's more good reasons to do it than just that it's the right and ethical thing to do. So I think that that's really important. And it, and it shouldn't depend on the personalities of the people who are there, the good people, the proactive and positive people. It should be institutionalized, so it's an expectation for whoever is in that chair or in that job that this is part of what you do. So uh, I want to uh, really agree with all of the conversation that's just happened in terms of the budgetary constraints. If our overarching goal is zero, um, uh, ancestral remains in our university museums and collections, uh, that is the ultimate goal. What will it take to get there? And it isn't just a, it's desirable timeline, it's when do we want to achieve that goal and what will it take us to do that in what kind of time frame? And given that the, the you know, budgetary constraints are real, <coughs> Can we work out a strategic plan or within the policy document that is the topic of conversation today, a, a sort of uh, uh, obligation to the campuses, and my campus is by far you know, the biggest obligation for the UC system in this regard. What can we do, what are the resources we need in five years, if that's the goal, in 10 years, in 15 or 20? In other words, uh, with current resources, how long do we think it would take to happen? If we doubled the resources, how much faster can it be achieved? If we quadrupled the resources, how much faster? Uh, our resources at Berkeley, the number of people working in these, first of all, I have to tell you, uh, I'm a computer scientist by training, so I have a two-year education in anthropology and archaeology. Uh, with, with respect to these matters, we need a higher level of uh, staffing in order to achieve the university and our campus's goal towards zero human remains, North American human remains in our collections in as fast a period of time as, quote, possible, unquote. How do we get to that? That should be a requirement to every campus to develop that kind of plan and tell us the resources to achieve it so we could make budgetary decisions to do it. Is it five years? Is it 10 years or whatever? So can I say um, we can take more on this just as a time check. We're going to take a break in about 10 minutes. But I, I feel the weight of comment is like from about here over so far today. And a few people, so if there's, I just want to pay a little more attention over to the side. Is there anybody here who has been wanting to get involved and maybe just hasn't had the chance yet? Um, she started the budget conversation. <laughs> she, she did. No, no, no. And, 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 that's all I want to say. No, I, pre, no, I appreciate that. I, OK, so can I get a mic over here? I just I feel like this side of the room isn't getting enough love. I just. Uh, hi, this is uh, Travis the Tipo at Morongo. Yeah. I mean, we, we've heard with Professor Goldberg and Wendy Teeter, UCLA is a unique situation. Um, but the UC has put the tribes in this situation as well, right? I mean, they've been collecting ancestral remains for decades and decades, holding them against the will of the tribes. Um, and you know, state government, we talk about unfunded mandates, but this is really, and obviously the tribes want to repatriate, but what the UC has done is created a huge unfunded mandate with all these ancestral remains. And Really, some of those remains may not go back to the tribes because the tribes don't have the mechanisms and the resources to, to do it. So they're gonna sit in paper bags or boxes or whatever they're at at these museums. And so I would hope that this working group 
would make some kind of recommendations that we have a UC president who's supportive to get some funding to actually get these remains back to where they belong. And so I appreciate the UCs have issues with getting money for what they need to do, but from the other perspective, they created the situation over the years and funded researchers who, who took these remains. Yeah, right. Uh, Will Madrigal and <clears throat> Kawia. And I, I just wanted to uh, add a caveat to the, uh, the need for funding uh, for obvious reasons, you know, um, for the NAGPRA process, and that's why we're here. But I'd also like to speak from the perspective of, of an educator. Um, I teach uh, the Kawia language here at UC Riverside. And it's something that we were really proud of finally achieving. Um, this campus was created in 1954, and there were Native people. One of them was my relative, Rupert Costo, that were here to ensure that this campus was a diverse institution that acknowledges the creation stories and the epistemological knowledge of Native peoples in this region. And so that's why we're here today. And I'd just like to add to um, the need for funding. Oh, there's also a need for programming and support on the campuses. I think we're all touching on the same uh, stigma that still exists and, and that we have to work through and that's gonna take uh, a lot of time and um, we're, we're working through it slowly, like today, we're addressing it. Um, but I would make a suggestion that we have the UCOP folks here is that um, we might take into consideration having uh, more courses offered on, on the campuses that uh, address certain needs of the community, like language, cultural preservation, um, marketing, you know, NAGPRA itself, having a course on NAGPRA, having the, our, our students to be introduced to this perspective that we're sharing today, this rich heritage, this, this very important voice and perspective. So I'd just like to, to add uh, my two cents and just say that um, uh, here at UC Riverside, we've really strived to improve our services and to uh, uplift the voice of the local Native people. And one of the ways that we've been able to do that and manifest that is uh, our Kawia language course, which is uh, being offered for the second year already. And it's had a profound impact on the attitude towards the Native people here in the region, as well as on campus. Um, we've been included in more of the the development conversations. Um, we've been talking, you know, with the chancellor on on expanding on, you know, our our current services that we have, and communicating directly with the tribal people in, in our regions and the the elders, the leaders, etc. So, um, I think what needs to happen is, yeah, there needs to be a very very serious conversation of allocating funding in order for any of this to come into fruition. But what can help with that are more on-campus services, more uh, culturally relevant courses that are um, addressing the needs, the immediate concerns and needs of the community, and that can be language classes, that can be um, coursework on NAGPRA, on uh, the conversations that um, archaeologists and Native people need to have and are currently having. And um, I'd also like to see you all at the Society for California Archaeology Conference of which I'm a member of, and that will be in March, um, March 11th to the 14th here in Riverside, downtown Riverside Convention Center. So I'm a part of the Native American Program Committee, and we are striving to have the best uh, Native American um, presence at our conference this year, and we'll be tackling all of these issues, the stigma issue, the historical you know, significance of Native voices, and um, the and we'd hope to see, you know, that those conversations will start to yield fruits that will start to um, have an impact on the local level. But I would encourage all those of you who are faculty, those of you who are uh, administrators, to keep that in mind that uh, to increase the presence of, of Native voices on campus will have a direct profound impact on how uh, all the policies, not just this NAGRA policy that we're working on today, but of the overall attitude and presence of, of Native people on their ancestral homelands, but also part of the UC community, the UC campus community. 
Thank you. You know, a similar point was, was brought up at, in Berkeley that the more visible you can be, the more people can appreciate what's there, that that's partially where more resources can come from because people see the need and see the value and see the rightness of it. So it, yeah, it, it, it all stems from awareness. Yeah, complete, it works together. Uh, Don, Mark, um, we got a mic. Thank you. The, a, a lot of comments about budget, and um, that is, it, it, I don't know who made the point. Was it Travis down there made the point about uh, the, uh, what we have here so far? Could be akin to a, an unfunded mandate. Um, so to the extent that, you know, maybe some consideration for uh, funding could be included in a uh, 2836 amended, amendment. Um, that, that, that's worth a shot, but um, there always needs to be some quantification of what that looks like. So uh, I, I'm going to put out there the question right now. What, what does the UC budget system-wide look like to do the necessary follow-through here? Um, I realize there's considerable work that, the, that that would entail, but is it already being done? Because I, I think we asked this question a while back, a few months ago, internally. Um, and, and, and so... But I'm asking again, putting that on the table so that uh, you know, I, I think we should work on getting an answer, uh, have that at the ready, mm -hmm. you know, because that, that needs to be a, an important part of the follow through. It's, this is not the first time budget considerations or this discussion has come up as necessary to getting the work done. Now, uh, on the editorial side of things, I will say uh, that uh, um, you know, 30 years in the making got us to this point here with the UC system. Um, I'm aware that across the country, uh, the universities have fared better in engaging and, and, and accomplishing the goals of NAGPRA. Um, and so uh, did they do it with existing budgets? Did they have bolstered budgets for NAGPRA pur pur purposes? I don't know. Um, somehow it got done. Now, uh, clearly there are elements here in the UC system that have been recalcitrant. Uh, we have sticks in the mud, people who give lip service to following the policy, but in, by action, um, they engineer letters that do otherwise, um, and all kinds of things. What we need to do as part of this budget discussion is we, this has also come up before in our internal discussions, we need to uh, consider or, or put as a policy point um, uh, a provision that, uh, that penalizes bad actors. Um, I am more and more convinced that this, this is an incentive to getting the work done. Uh, uh, I was listening to Mr. Katz over here describe, you know, potentially, you know, if, if, we, if we double the money, double the budget, um, maybe we get done in five years instead of 10 years, or get done in 10 years instead of 15 years if we triple the budget. Well, there, I, I'm convinced that every system has its weak links. You know, that's why, we, that's why legislation is, is often created, to account for the weak link in a system. Well. There are always going to be weak links, given human nature, in the UC system and any other system as well. So to that point, um, no, nobody's ever had a disincentive. And no individual professor or faculty member in the UC system has ever had a disincentive to for, for, for not engaging faithfully or complying faithfully with the federal law called NAGPRA and its state equivalent, uh, Cal NAGPRA. There's just no penalty to not comply. There needs to be, and that is, this is an important policy point. It's gonna be important in the follow through, it's gonna be important in the guidance document that comes after this. Um, there, there needs to be a punishment. I, I will put out there, removal of tenure, removal of status, removal of the position as a faculty member, maybe this is where the academic senate can actually weigh in meaningfully. Um, to, to hopefully agree with these policy points. This is serious business for, uh, for the tribal communities. The, the, our, our spiritual and religious health and well-being, and it's, it's been flouted for 30 years. No exaggeration. So what, what has been done to this point uh, has not worked well enough here in the UC system. Part of that, once again, there's no penalty for for being a bad actor. There needs to be, and this needs to change. Okay. You want to hand it down? Thanks. Thank you for mentioning that. And, and it occurs to me, as you say that, that 
you know, if we are concerned about budget, penalizing actors that fail to comply uh, might help save some bucks, right? Because uh, if people are more willing uh, to help out in this project, you know, if there's an actual stick involved, right, then the process will go quicker. Just, just putting that out there, not to mention, you know, I, I doubt that this would happen, but uh, if people were ever removed, <laughs> you know, from whatever funding with, w was withdrawn, hey, well, that's another, you know, I know budgets don't work that way, but just putting that out there, you know, that, that could also, you know, be another reason why, you know, maybe actual penal measures, uh, you know, could, uh, uh, could be implemented. That, that came up in Berkeley, too, the lack of consequences for not doing it. Uh, can we, yeah, give the follow-up? Yeah, yeah, she just said something I, I left out. Um, penalizing the individual bad actors is, is fundamental. Um, along with that, though, there needs, I think, consideration, uh, there needs to be consideration of penalizing the department of that individual if things aren't taken seriously on, in acting against that individual. And if that is not enough, penalizing the campus and the funding that is received for a variety of things uh, needs to be done. The threat was made in the original NAGPRA. We need to make good on the threat. And, and I know peer review is always an important part of uh, uh, academicians' uh, work product. It needs to be the same right here. Peer pressure needs to be put, brought to bear on bad actors. This is, there was a little bit of this discussion earlier, out, er, earlier in, the, in our discussion here where you know, we need to incentivize people who are willing to, 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 to be a whistleblower and come forward and, and you know, they know about something in the closet. I mean, that's absolutely appalling. I, I appreciate the pressure that somebody is under to not disclose that because they're your advisor, they're your PhD advisor, or you are subordinate to them somewhere in that department. That needs, that ship needs to be righted. There's an absolute wrong going on there. And it's criminal and it's immoral. So I see two more hands. Why don't we end there for the time being, take a quick break, and if we want to just come right back to this, we, we don't have to be done with it. I saw your hand up. Just briefly, um, you know, I appreciate the kind words um, that several of you have said, but I really want to underscore the important work that not just Wendy Teeter has done, but also to acknowledge our chancellor, Jean Block, um, who was very forthcoming when the desire for reburial was expressed and uh, felt very strongly that the campus needed to underwrite the cost of that. Um, just a little bit of context about how it worked over the years when Wendy was making these requests. Um, what I remember most vividly was um, the expression on our Vice Chancellor for Research's face when she would come to him year after year and say, it's not done yet. And he kept saying, can't you get it done? And it turned out that all, all of the, the consultation, all of the trust building that went on for all those years when Wendy refused to just take shortcuts in carrying out this work um, paid off immeasurably when we needed the, the cooperation and collaboration of tribes, including the Fernandinho Tataviam. Um, to carry out this reburial. So um, be prepared. Um, it's, you know, it's not a real simple, um, just uh, one and out kind of process. It, it's uh, iterative. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the word of the day. <laughs> All right, thanks. You wanna go last? I, I just, one thing in closing to Chairman Macaro's comments is the, the penalties piece the groundwork is actually already laid for that in California NAGPRA. The NHC, under their, uh, in their role as Repatriation Oversight Commission for California NAGPRA, it, one of the duties that we have, among other things, is to impose penalties for noncompliance. So this kind of thing is already in the works. We don't have our regs drafted yet, which puts a little more meat on the bone about that, but the statute is clear that um, for noncompliance, the commission can 
take the look at those situations and take those actions. So I don't think this is at coming out of left field. Folks have thought about this, and this was a big part of what what was missing from the California perspective. So maybe we can build off of that somehow. All right. Somebody wants to make one more comment before we finish. Again, again, we can come right back to this. I'll make this brief, but I wanted to follow up on the on the budget comments and yeah. questions that came out, and especially in regards to UC Berkeley and about the 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 needs for assistance to tribes for the sometimes in the in the process of reburial for for resources. Um, I I'm not sure that the the scary budget uh, scenario out there is is quite what we're really looking at. And I think that the, 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 the question of completing uh, uh, cultural affiliation reviews for some of these remains, especially at UC Berkeley, is much probably easier than you think. I think it's important to understand that uh, the scenario of, col of consultation over the last few decades at UC Berkeley, as represented in draft notices of inventory completion from UC Berkeley back in 2000, two and 2004 are grossly inaccurate. <clears throat> I, 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 Chancellor Katz is not going to say because we've had this discussion. We had this discussion a couple of years ago. <clears throat> um, over the decades, over the, in the late 90s, early 2000s, there were lots of consultation that took place at UC Berkeley in regards to cultural collections that were represented as consultations on human remains. And those consultations never took place on human remains. The 9,200 individuals or ancestral remains that are 86% listed as culturally unidentifiable, that determination was done outside of consultation. <coughs> and, and we have the, the records for that as well. Also, there was a discussion, there was, so there was a, a question on or a comment from someone about, you know, that the, the burden of repatriation and reburial sometimes can be challenging for tribes with little land resources or financial mm -hmm. resources. <clears throat> and um, my uh, partner, Christina, suggested that is it possible to consider in the policy the use of appropriate excess or unused UC lands for the reburial purpose to consider that in, in consultation with tribes? We, we heard that at Berkeley very loud and clear as well, so thank you. It's interesting to see where some of the comments are came up over and over again. I'm sure we'll have more of that by the time we finish the sessions. Let's take a 10-minute break. I think there's some refreshments out there, and then we'll come back and keep going.
so yeah, so this way I'm gonna tell him that you have the C three mic, so he'll know that if you're handing it to somebody, it's you're handing it to him this one, and if I'm handing it to him this one. So, so, um, so yours is gonna help me okay. with the mic. So he's going. He has the. Okay, we're ready to start again. Are we ready? So I, I have a quick update. Actually, let me take the mic over to Liz here. Um, I was asked again at the break, uh, and actually I'd already gotten an update. I'm sorry. Just didn't want to get going. Um, about the live streaming again, because that was duly noted, and some people have been having some conversations. So let's, can you update us on, by, by the way, there's live streaming, and then there's recording. It can be recorded, but maybe not live streamed. So they're still working on the bugs, how to make that happen. Liz? Right, uh, so although we had only planned on live streaming Berkeley and Riverside, I have my staff right now looking into, at the very least, recording uh, Santa Barbara and Davis but we're gonna try to live stream at those two locations. But if that doesn't work out for whatever reason, we'll at least record those and post those. Well, would, would, if that's the case, or if that were the case in one of those, while it would not provide the live streaming, it would at least meet the objective of having a record. Right. Okay, so that's, that's where we stand now. Thank you. Okay. All right, so. Well, I keep confusing these guys about which mic. Um, we can pick up where we left off. We can start something wholly new. It's, it's been really interesting how different the two sessions have been. Um, we've focused a lot on policy language, what was in the policy in, in Berkeley. Uh, we've focused a lot here on process and implementation. So we can go anywhere we want, but if, if for example, there are I handed out that matrix, or there was not, we haven't even looked at that, and that's fine if we don't, but if there is any input that we haven't gotten to yet about the policy itself, um, and we want to weave that into our last couple of hours together, I just wanted to, to mention that, that that's another possibility. So let's go. Thank you. Um, I guess that's an invitation um, to talk about one item. Um, I think it was item three on the matrix maybe is the most relevant, even though it kind of goes among several pieces. Um, so we've been talking a little bit about the need for more detail and specificity. And I think at the Berkeley session, uh, Provost Brown brought up the issue of interpretation, that he was hearing that there's sort of interpretation going on out there and um, question of discretion and is that discretion being exercised in a way that makes sense? So I want to talk a little bit about that. Um, there are specific issues that come up when you're implementing NAGPRA, and are you talking about repatriation as a process? Because you might hear a staff person at a, at a university say, oh yes, I do repatriation. And I think they're really meaning I implement this process that may not result in the outcome mm. of ancestors and their belongings actually going back to the tribal people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's a repatriation process, which I think we've been kind of talking about, but not necessarily the repatriation outcome, which is what I thought I heard the president and others say today, and the gentleman from, from Berkeley about, you know, zero percent retention in the collection. So that's an outcome not just a process. So I don't want to get in the complete weeds about it, um, but I think we need more detail under those green items here <coughs> under number three. And what do I mean by that? What are some of the obstacles to repatriation, I mean the outcome of the human remains actually going back? One of them is this whole notion of 
the minimum number of individuals, the MNI. What does that mean? There are some places that are interpreting that, including UC Davis, as the maximum number of individuals. We need to go through every funnel bag. We need to handle everything to find out that actual high number because we don't want to miss something and put something wrong in our counts. Where you may have the culturally affiliated tribe saying, that's a minimum number. Just treat that as a lot. Assign the number one to it. We don't need to know how many of our ancestors are necessarily in there. Some tribes feel that way. Maybe others feel different, but for those who feel that way, just repatriate the lot. It's all coming from a cemetery. It's all related to a human remain, an ancestor who was there. Another place that comes up, and this was talked about a little bit, was what's associated funerary item, right? And I think the facilitator made a beautiful analogy at the Berkeley session on, well, my father was buried with his wedding ring, and for my family, that was an associated funerary object. You would never want that to be separated from your dad, I imagine. Um, but that ring wasn't made specifically for that eventu eventuality. So, and then the notion of is something 10 centimeters away or 15 centimeters away when it was found. Um, what about the situation that I heard of where there was, um, there was an, an ancestor with one earring and then there was the other earring that was outside of what the archaeologists had established as the associated distance, so that matching earring didn't count because it wasn't associated within the criteria of the university and their academicians and their museum specialists. Um, so I just raised those issues, you know, so I think there's a lot more detail that this matrix doesn't maybe mean to do disservice to, but it really does because at the end of the day, you can have this revised policy one, two, three, four, ten, high level, fluffy language. It sounds good, but the bottom line is what are the people from the UC staff who are interfacing with the collections and the ancestors and the living tribal peoples, how are they interpreting what they think their obligations are under federal and state NAGPRA? And when we saw, when Auburn saw the first draft, we said to ourselves, this sounds like they're trying to institutionalize the NAGPRA policy at UC Davis. And that's not okay with us. That's not a model process, and, and I know that Megan Noble is here, and I, and I introduced myself to her earlier today, and I'm not trying to make this a personality thing at all, but this is no surprise to her because we've been in a dispute with Davis over the Auburn Dam collection that had to be elevated to the Heritage Commission. You see, Davis would not even participate in the mediation for that. So that's why when people are asking for a, a, a commitment to dispute resolution, and there is no commitment to that, how, how is the actual repatriation process and outcome going to be different under this revised policy if we don't get to some of the details in how the summaries and the inventories are going and the universe of materials? People are shocked to find out the universe of materials that have been taken away saying that's not NAGPRA part of the collection. And the tribes don't even know that that collection's been separated into what the academicians deem is NAGPRA or non-NAGPRA. Huge issue, not a model. And, um, you know, so getting to the issue of interpretation, besides getting more detail there, another thing that I think this policy could do and add in as a guiding principle is sort of a, aligned with federal law and the canons of construction for federal Indian law, which is if there's an ambiguity or a question, you are supposed to interpret it in a way that benefits the tribes. That overarching core principle, guiding principle, isn't in here. And that's where we are having the on the ground fights and battles every day. And I see some people nodding their heads yes in here. And uh, that is the only way 
that we're going to get to an outcome that's even close to getting more repatriation is if we're able to do that. So I would strongly encourage adding in that reference to, you know, if there's a question of interpretation, we are going to err on the side of benefiting the tribes because federal NAGPRA is not under 36 CFR. It is not a museum law. It's a piece of Indian law. So the museum specialists, as much as I respect many as individuals, they must not be dictating what the federal and state NAGPRA outcomes are. But that's what you see has now in a lot of respects, and that's where the tribes are fighting it on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's got to change. Um, well, there's probably more to say on that, but I will stop on that for the moment. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so, uh, with my tribal chair hat on, uh, what? What was just being dis discussed right now is, is something that's very important to, uh, to Pechanga and what we encountered with, uh, in our dealings with Berkeley. Um, we were trying to get a, a, a ruling of cultural affiliation, um, which we, di we didn't get on, I think, an arbitrary and capricious uh, consideration um, by the campus committee or the chair of that committee at the time. And, um, uh, listening to your specific, what, what triggered this in my head was your your, your notion of, uh, you know, if something is 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 buried or interred with some somebody, you know, clearly it was on them, um, so it's found with their remains. Uh, that's one thing. If it's found ten centimeters away, that's another. And if it's fifteen centimeters away, um, it then becomes open to interpretation. The, the problem is the open to interpretation part where the academic experts might say, well, they have said in some cases that, um, well, look, we've been studying this for uh, decades and, and the, we know academic, academia, we know the material culture of these people. And so uh, if something's not with the actual remains or apparently on the body, uh, but some distance away, it is not a, an associated funerary object. Um, and and, and the, we, the tribe, might be saying, or have said, uh, look, this is our religious practice. We know this item. We know that the intent was this item was supposed to be with the body. Uh, for whatever reason, it's 10 or 15 centimeters away. And the end result usually is that, that the <coughs> university interpretation wins. Um, and then we are prevented from repatriating the item. We're actually, we're, we're prevented from uh, uh, being uh, uh, bestowed with the cultural affiliation that is necessary. And so I, what I'm getting to is that this, there, there is this notion. I'm glad, because I thought of this earlier, and I was going to bring it up and forgot. Uh, the, the, these canons of construction are, are really important. Um, and, and my own readings as a tribal leader over the years about canons of construction you know, the intent of them is supposed to reduce the cheat in a system, right? It, it, the, the cheat that, that otherwise is there where somebody introduces their own bias or their own interests uh, for how something gets interpreted. Um, so it's astounding in this day and age that um, where there's an apparent um, uh, outcome that could go either way, that uh, the outcome isn't given to the tribe, and it should be, because the tribe's interpretation is going to be the correct one. The tribe's interpretation of, of th the locus of an item that is associated with uh, uh, an ancestral remain is based on not only material culture, it's based on religion, it's based on culture, it's based on stuff that we practice and stuff that we know. Um, yet that, at many turns, is excluded from the consideration. And the academic that's in the seat of power in the decision-making role uh, wins the day and wins the argument. And we've run up against that buzzsaw many times over the last three decades, um, and not just in the UC system but elsewhere. And so here's an opportunity to correct this. And the way to correct it is that the, the, the process, the policy needs to side with uh, the tribe. The tribe will be right. The tribal interpretation is the correct one. Um, 
not not the archaeologist's interpretation, not the anthropologist or the osteologist's interpretation. So it's a very important point. It goes to the core of what we're trying to do here. Because when you talk about repatriation, you were talking about what that means, bringing back our ancestors, our people, back to our tribal lands, back to how things should have been. And it's attempt to try to hit the reset button on this. Uh, hi, this is uh, Travis. Um, I wanted to comment about this issue, you know, the, the trust level we talked about and then having something in these policies to side on what the tribes, you know, go back to canyons and construction and things like that. Um, and what the chairman's talking about, this sort of c cultural knowledge and expertise that the tribes have. But I do want to mention, you know, tribes like Pachanga have very able professional and academic people who are archaeologists and anthropologists and there's a lot of other tribal archaeologists here, and even beyond the cultural knowledge, when you go to academics, and the Erie example is so easily refutable, right? I would think every tribal archaeologist here would say that's connected. Um, even the archaeological knowledge that tribes have is often discounted, let alone the cultural knowledge. And so I think that's going to this idea where, where in this policy are we have some protections, um, because everything often is being discounted. So I think we need to add it in light of these three comments, add a definition in this policy about tribal knowledge, and then that be folded in to all of the steps where consultation occurs and inventories are created and cultural affiliation determinations are made, that the tribal knowledge is factored in in an equally balanced way and that the and if there and that the canons of construction, if they're you know it, that the deference is because to the tribes because what we're talking about is everybody and we can so easily get in the weeds on this and and have universities and folks that are at the staff level do, working this program that they're the repatriation programs and forget that the the touch point and the overarching pieces. To start from the beginning, the tribes were wronged. And can the UC show that they have legal uh, right to even hold these items? Do they have the legal paperwork that says, we're the rightful owners. <laughs> we you know, acquired this through legal means or acquired this through rightful means? No. And so we're already starting at a point where the tribes are, they they're disadvantaged to the to the trauma to the healing and and this makes sense it's already embedded in the federal law for section 106 compliance when you look at what are called traditional cultural properties you evaluate whether it meets the requirements of being a traditional cultural property through the lens of the community that values the property that values the place you don't do it through a Western lens. You don't do it through your particular bias lens. You evaluate it through the lens of the community. And that means listening to those people that are the community and taking their word for what they're saying and acknowledging that tribal knowledge is just as important as an academic type of knowledge or science. And that's where we're missing that piece in here. Um, so that's just my proposal because that is already a known quantity in the federal construct about tribal knowledge being incorporated and about um, evaluating through that lens and not another, not an academic lens or, a, or a, a scientific lens that excludes the tribal knowledge. I, so you said equal, I think, twice, and, and but then I heard you also use the word deference, and I. I thought I, what I heard around was that tribal knowledge should have primacy. So uh, can you just say a little bit more what, what is equal versus deference versus? Well, I'm just saying they yeah. equally on the record. Like on the, okay. Equally on the record, and then, then the deference is okay. to the tribal knowledge in those circumstances. OK, thanks. Go ahead, thanks. I hope this isn't taking us too far afield, but um, as uh, 
somebody who's been an academic for all of her adult life. Um, I just want to add that um, when we try to juxtapose tribal knowledge and academic knowledge, um, we may be overlooking the fact that academic knowledge isn't really as complete as it needs to be without tribal knowledge. Um, and um, our um, representative from San Manuel isn't here, I think, still, but I want to acknowledge um, the San Manuel Band of Mission Indians for having supported at UCLA something called the Tribal Learning Community and Educational Exchange Program, which was designed to enrich the academic work of the university with tribal knowledge. Um, and I just want to say that our, our academic knowledge suffers when it is not informed by that tribal knowledge. So, I don't know. Go ahead. I have a, I have a related follow-on comment to make, but before I do that, I, I'd like to get a little feedback from the UC people on what they're hearing about interpretations and um, the canons of construction. I, I just want to at least <laughs> I want to get a little feedback before I move on to a related point. Welcome. Microphone, please. I um, I had a very simple reaction for me. Um, uh, uh, and and as I listened, and I and I said, well, why, why would they do that? You know, I, I kept saying to myself, I said, uh, given that the purpose of the policy is to advance repatriation, right, um, to make the kind of decisions you were describing would not advance repatriation. The answer it, we got to that question, because we would ask that, and the answer we got back was, this is required by NAGPRA. And then we would say, well, where? Where do you see this in NAGPRA? Oh, I wasn't or directing that question okay. really to you to answer. I was more saying to myself, if the policy goal is to advance repatriation, that would fly in the face of that kind of decision making, it seems to me. And um, I, I, I do not know what people have been doing before now. Um, but it would seem to me, uh, uh, at least the president, I believe, would say to me that that kind of decision making shouldn't be happening. It does not advance the goals. And, uh, and I like the language personally. I mean, we've got to talk about it, but I, I, uh, there's a couple of things that were stated that I, I, I really liked. One is, you know, if there's ambiguity on a question, um, uh, and it sounds like this this appeals to specific, I mean, I've read it, but I don't remember this, um, but it, it sounds like it appeals to some specific language in NAGPRA, but in, in any case, I wrote it, and that is if, it's, um, if, if there is ambiguity, it is supposed to be interpreted in a way that benefits the tribe. The, I read that as saying it's supposed to be interpreted in a way that advances repatriation. Uh, that's how I, um, uh, interpreted that language. So I don't know if that kind of is the kind of response uh, that you're looking for, but I know that I've noted that this conversation on that point needs to be discussed b around the group so that we can flesh it out and put the right language in. It is absolutely critical and essential. What I also heard is that there's these canons, which, which I think she also was wondering what the response was, that NAGPRA is not the sole and last word on these on these issues from her perspective. So, is how how much is that currently factored into the policy? That there's more to it than NAGPRA. And maybe you need time to think about that. And maybe there's not immediate response. But she's talking about other Indian related laws besides NAGPRA. Was what I yeah. thought I heard. I, I can comment on this. Okay, it's thanks. not beyond NAGPRA. It is NAGPRA. That is, that as a federal law, um, it is to be construed according to these canons of construction um, for the benefit of the tribes. And uh, ambiguities, as you heard, to be resolved in their favor. And um, so you can take the spirit of that canon of construction and apply it to this policy as well. 
Okay. Um, but you would have to make that explicit at the outset as a guiding, pr as one of the guiding principles. Um, and I think that's what was being said here. All right, thanks. I misunderstood that. Thank you. So um, obviously we have done not very good things in the past. And you know, I hope that as a, as a group uh, we can assume goodwill going forward. Uh, and I think there's some real signs of this. As the Berkeley NAGPRA official, I apologize to Chairman Macaro in terms of the rendering of the decision we made in the particular case that he mentioned. And part of that was not just issues related to the sensitivities around uh, sort of tribal evidence, which we needed to consider more deeply. In addition, this is a very complex environment to make decisions in the face of uh, you know, multiple claims of uh, uh, repatriation. And so uh, I think one of the, the substantial things that have taken place in the last few months is the president of the university sa has said, our priority is repatriation. Our chancellor has said, our priority is repatriation. I mean, this is as this an has outcome, not a process. As, as <laughs> an outcome. So, yes, thank you. I want to be very clear. About thank, you. That. thank you, Michael. I mean, it, it, you know, this is instruction from the top down, and in addition, the the sort of reformulation of our uh, as required by policy and the law, the reformulation of our NAGPRA committees will give much much stronger voice to uh, tribal knowledge in the rendering of decisions that are, are made or recommendations that are made by the, the campus committees. So I think we are substantially moving in a positive direction, both from the top and from the construction of the review process that will exist on our campuses. But again, I want to echo what Michael has said is our number one priority is repatriation and to, to have our decisions driven by that overarching goal of the campuses. And one additional response uh, 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 that I would add here, uh, because I just liked how Carol said it, uh, but it speaks to, I'm a social scientist, so, uh, um, and, and, and it spoke to me, and that is, uh, how can academic knowledge be complete unless it incorporates all available knowledge? And, uh, and tribal knowledge is a part of that available knowledge. So I, I guess uh, uh, I like that language. I don't know how we'll incorporate it, um, but, um, but that spoke to me as well. well. I'm delighted to hear that. And uh, you know, in the spirit of convergence, um, <laughs> I've been trying on several occasions to point out that there is more convergence between um, the academic interests of the university properly understood and tribal interests in properly repatriation than, than has been the case. Um, but I did want to take a moment to um, try to formulate a response to that question that came into your head, which is a very reasonable question, <laughs> which is how could these things, how could these things be happening if the policy is supposed to be repatriation? And you know, I speak from years in the trenches, sitting in these system-wide UC uh, committee meetings as the only non-archaeologist in the meetings. Um, and remember, the policy said that if the campus wants to repatriate, it can be appealed. So whenever UCLA wanted to repatriate, we had to defend it in these meetings. Mm -hmm. And by yourself. But, well, I had, I had Wendy with me. Um, but, I, you know, one of the things that went on in these meetings was divide and conquer strategy. Sometimes there would actually be an attempt to justify what was being argued against repatriation in the name of NAGPRA, um, claiming that we can't repatriate to this one because it would alienate um, that one. And um, it and was. That in, pol in policy draft too. Well, I think we need to scrutinize it carefully. Look, there are going to be some situations where there are conflicting claims, and that's you know unavoidable. But um, what I observed was far more cynical than that. Um, 
And it was um, you know, very, very troubling. But I just want you to know that some of it was being done ostensibly in the name of NAGPRA. Um, it's required by NAGPRA. That's what Megan Noble told UASC when they offered NAGPRA. Sure. Um, Which, where, where should I go first? Oh, you had your hand up. <laughs> I think to add on that, you, too. We haven't heard from you yet. Could you just say your name for the stream? Hi, everyone. It's Christina Snyder. Um, I To add on that, too, I think it would be um, helpful to understand how the UC legal department is going to um, process all of this and how this is going to be used as guidance for them. Because at the end of the day, I think a lot of the struggles that we're hearing about are happening with the legal representatives um, and so if the policy isn't actually being processed by them if it has, if it's not being understood as um, uh, what it's supposed to be or if it's being viewed from a perspective that doesn't view all of this as valid then it's only as good as the paper it's written on right. yeah. I am Megan Noble as you likely know from <laughs> based on this conversation um, and I don't want to litigate or discuss the specifics of this situation in too much detail because I don't really think it's appropriate in this venue. Um, but I do just want to make a couple of points about what is required by NAGPRA and the process we went through to determine what was required by NAGPRA. And the situation about the minimum number of individuals that we're discussing, there were multiple consulting parties. And this is the difficulty of being a um, tribal, we are in the middle and we're hearing one thing from one tribe that is asking us for very detailed information and to make those identifications in the fauna. And we're hearing from another tribe to not touch anything. Um, and so we are at a very difficult crossroads. Um, we enlisted the help of National NAGPRA to help us resolve this um, over multiple calls. Um, we did have discussion with Native American, we had extensive conversation with Terry Robinson at Native American Heritage Commission about this issue. So it was an extensive and exhausting process and I'm sure both the tribe and the university um, feel that. But I just wanted to provide a little bit of context. So it's not that we were um, unopen to that discussion or unopen to changing our ways. We did definitely incorporate many parts um, of what we were hearing from the tribes um, to try and address some of the concerns. Um, ultimately, we were, we were not able to reach a resolution and, and it's unfortunate and we wish there was a better outcome. Um, we're happy to reconsider that moving forward um, and we, do, we are interested in a dialogue. Um, we did just spend exhaustive resources and at the end of the day we did feel out of consideration to all the tribes um, wanted to be able to move forward with that response. Over here. Um, I want to just go back to Christina Snyder's comment um, because we're talking about a construct and a, and a bureaucracy, if you will, within the UC that has certain layers and certain, you know, hiring advisors and having review of this, you know, and Megan's pointing out an exact situation where she had to consult with other people and she did that. And I think that those are the, un, those are the hidden pieces and the unknowns um, that are not accounted for in here in terms of tightly drafted language that prevents those sort of, um, I don't know, I don't know what to call them, but you know, I guess sets forth a certain policy that gets to a desired outcome and doesn't allow for these ob obviations from that. And I think that's a, 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 a huge issue. And I'm just gonna say it, I think the legal advisor to the UC on repatriation has, has clearly been the person or people who have sort of directed the tone or the policy or what's allowable or what's okay and what's not allowable thus far, sort of behind the scenes for a bunch of these staff people that are charged with carrying this out. And so that is an issue. Like the, the, who is doing that? And who, and, and, and what that advice is and what their interpretation of the law is, is a huge issue that nobody's really talked about a lot. Um, we're just thinking we can draft a policy and that'll be fine. But when it comes down to, you know, things that are not clear, uh, conflicts, 
uh, potential um, competing claims. These are all going to go up to some other person in the legal department at UC that's going to be advising. And that is, again, back why we need these clear directives on federal Indian law and rooting this into the history and into you know, the governor's apology for what happened in California, the history of, of removal and the history of disconnecting the tribes from, this, from you know, their places and these things. And this, doesn't, this isn't written with an eye to fold all that in so that it's read in a way that actually is deferential to the tribes and to making repatriation happen and not having the impediments that what Courtney, the reason she tried to bring the, the or she brought this issue up is we already need to talk about the impediments, not how to do it. We need to talk about why it hasn't been done all this time because that's, that's where the answers lie. Can I just add that um, in, any number of times today people have said we need language that says this, we need language that does that. I'm, I'm assuming many of you will also, in addition to these sessions, submit written comments. And to the degree to which you would like to suggest language, obviously, that might be really helpful to them. If, if you think there's language that gets at that, that either is missing or is better than the language that's there, it just it takes some of the guesswork out of it as far as what might actually work. So, We're going to do that, but again, this is so difficult. This burden shouldn't be on the tribes to fix UC's problem. So I'm gonna, we're gonna, the tribes are gonna draft UC's policy. No. You know, and I'm not saying that you're saying that, but just that hint at, okay, tell us what you wanna say then. I mean, that is a big deal. Then are we gonna be heard? Are you gonna hear our voice? Is it gonna get incorporated? You know, we don't know. It's, it's a building of a trust of a relationship. And then the idea that, OK, no, this is an opportunity for you. But no, it's a burden. It's, it, 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 there's just got to be an acknowledgment about that. And, and of course, we're going to do that. But I just needed to say that. Because we've got to keep in mind that this, the UC she should be doing this in a reparations. I think that was raised earlier with that, um, that frame. Yeah, my, my only thought is since we were working towards convergence and eliminating interpretation, sometimes you could be helpful in getting there faster, even if it's a burden on you. And I, like you said, you know you're, you're going to do it. So he was next. EC3, hang on. your question about why people are doing this or why they're doing it. And I'm just going to be blunt with everyone in the room. The reason we get in so much uh, problems and all sorts of consultation is because decision makers and agencies thinks the tribes are just making it up. That there's this, you don't have, you're just saying this stuff, you know? And I think there's some uh, um, guidance coming out in section 106 that talks about that process needs to be creative and flexible enough to adapt to individual cultures. I shouldn't, as a TIPO have to divulge certain information that tribal elders have told me that justify what I'm doing. And so under federal law, I think we're looking at sort of a more flexible um, way to approach consultation. But even under AB 52 amendments to CEQA, when you look at substantial evidence, there's supposed to be certain deference given to qualified tribal experts being elders or their archaeologists. And so I'd like to see some of this policy have that kind of language or attitude in it where there we don't have to divulge certain things, and it's respected, because that's the problem I see in all sorts of consultation. Agencies want all this information, and we don't want to give it to them. Why should we give people this information? And they've done really bad things with this information um, before. I mean, we were in a consultation with a, a um, state and federal project where there was a freedom of information request. And um, because of how it was made, involving multiple energy projects, it was possible that they were going to get our data. So even if things are confidential, there's ways that things get out. And so I would think if a way the UC can acknowledge these things that we're seeing in 106 and maybe in AB 52, those kind of ideas. 
Uh, AB 52 amendments to CEQA, yeah, under substantial evidence. And so I think, you know, that's, I think it, when you're talking to academics, um, it goes back to my point earlier about, you know, tribes have trained archaeologists and that, that knowledge that they have is discounted based on this, the quote unquote, science of archaeology. So, you know, thinking about all this and after we're all done and we have these, these policies, many of us are going to have to then deal with UC to get ancestral remains back. And so if there should be something that we could rely on that says you have to look at this, you have to see that, you know, you have to give a certain weight to what we're saying and we don't have to divulge everything to you. I don't have to tell you a certain story why we think that that's an ancestral remain of the Morongo people. Hmm. Um, UAIC, you know, will be happy to submit language and written comments. Um, we did that in the last go round and um, Lourdes was kind enough to say how useful our comments were and how specific they were. But then when our technical staff looked at revision two, she didn't see our language. She didn't see the input, right? So then we gotta go back you know, to leadership and justify why we're continuing to participate in a process where maybe our staff isn't seeing the technical changes. So we are going to do that, but without the feedback, and we've already talked about, I'm not gonna r ride that horse again, it's just difficult to know okay. how to make your comments as helpful. Uh, what else do you need to say? Um, so that's the one part. Getting back to the earlier comment, um, not trying to re-litigate the Auburn Dam collection in any way, I'm using it because I think using concrete examples are sometimes very illustrative and um, you know, you heard in the first three sentences said back that it was required by NAGPRA and the divide and conquer aspect that Carol had talked about, coming right back, right initially. So um, that's what tribes are having to deal with and that's the rationale. Um, we did have the calls with National NAGPRA. Um, my takeaway from those calls is that they felt that there was latitude on how NAGPRA was implemented. Again, there's that discretion, there's that interpretation. Why it was interpreted in a manner against the tribes, that's the question. And that's why having this reference to federal canons, CEQA, NHPA could maybe help when there's that issue. Um, excessive handling also was up on the board, I don't know if it was number five, I think it was in the matrix, where um, it says, it may be difficult in some cases to determine if the remains and materials are Native American without the use of handling. And where tribes would probably say in many cases, it's excessive handling, um, because you've got site records, field notes, the context of the find, which is what many coroners now are using. If there's a cultural context to it, then those remains and the fragments are most likely uh, Native American. So I think there are ways to do it without having to do excessive handling. If, if you have a skeleton, there's an article on uh, these bones are, are red. There's non-invasive ways to looking at things to find the shovel tooth that might be inside the jaw if the tribe agrees to that kind of a thing. So you don't need to be handling these, which causes breakage and damage and disrespect in many cases. Um, you know, I was there when the remains came back from the Smithsonian in Chick-fil-A boxes. <laughs> from UCSD. They came back in Chick-fil-A boxes and they were packaged so poorly, pieces fell out. I mean, that's not okay. What's happening is not okay. The more you move and handle these things, there's damage that happens, inadvertent or intentional. You don't, if you don't need to be handling it, don't. Don't go looking to make conflict between the potentially culturally affiliated tribes to get what your museum department wants. That's not okay to do that. Manufacture the divide and conquer. That's not okay. Um, getting back to matrix item three at the top. Um, Back to respectful handling and safety and security of collections. Again, relative to the Auburn Dam collection, I believe the tribe wanted to leave an offering, maybe it was, I don't know, 
um, mugwort or something in a, in a container that was fixed, and that was denied as not. <laughs> you know, so who's ever really writing these policies, ghost writing these drafts, they may not be operating under a model that really works for the tribes. So I would hope that that offerings language is a place that also gets looked at, um, or at least that's, that's where we see that it goes over here under uh, traditional care, that there's more that can be said under traditional care that really allows the tribal people, you know, who are getting sick in some cases when they're coming in and attending to these collections, they're, the living tribal people are getting sick. So whatever system isn't working, and, and this one has so many checkpoints um, that how's this going to be interpreted by the museum people who are handling these collections? They, have, they still have discretion, you know, to say no. Artist, did, I couldn't tell. Did you have a question or a clarification? No, I was um, just thinking that the section that I think um, talks about um, how we care for the human remains and for the cultural items is on the st in the stewardship section, and um, it does um, uh, make reference to the tribal input for um, for how we re retain those. Um, it's critical, yes, that we receive the input from the tribe about how they want us to care for. And what do you do with that input? Wait for the mic, please. Right? Thank you. I mean, you know, and I hate to have to do a redirect each time, but this level of detail is really important. So I guess it says that it will only be done to the extent possible, and there are cases where traditional care requests cannot be strictly accommodated. I mean, there's so many buts and ifs and caveats that, you know, somebody who wants to interpret it in a certain way can just pop it up, and it does have ramifications to the collections and to the culturally affiliated people. Don't just take what a museum specialist is telling you is the way to do it. There's other factors here, and this isn't in 36 CFR. This isn't about museum collections. This is supposed to be Indian law, human rights law. Let's really apply that veneer to the decision making that people have while they're storting um, the collections. What else? Um, I had a comment regarding the procedures and when it comes to the committees especially about the tribal representatives' um, qualifications that we are currently asking for. Um, um, as far as I understand, the three elders or spiritual leaders will are not only designated by their tribes, but then they also have to have this minimum of five years of prior experience in either NACPRA, tribal consultation, um, or cultural resources protection. So um, as a, a tribal person, I feel a little bit offended by that because I think if the tribe designates a certain person to be this tribal representative, it's the prerogative of the tribe to set the minimum qualifications. It should not come out of this policy, um, especially when then considered that the UC representatives do not need to have this qualification. Um, they are listed like um, people with a sociology degree or environmental studies degree. And again, that does not mean that they are experienced in tribal consultation. So why is it asked by the, or for the tribal representative? So, so those, I, yeah. yeah, those requirements came from Kelnegra. So we're um, um, capturing those requirements per the California law. Um, however, we've heard those those, that concern before, um, both from the UC side and uh, tribal uh, representatives. And that's why we added a paragraph that allows for exceptions so that if the purpose is for repatriation that the chancellor and the president have the discretion of making an exception. 
Um, it's going to, those exceptions are going to be with tribal input, you know, but the, it's, it's still a pathway to do exactly what you said. Com you know, we, we intend to comply with the law, but where somebody doesn't quite meet those uh, requirements, then we would um, go through the exception route. Then I would like to have these same qualifications added to the UC representatives because apparently they would have to have the same five year experience working with tribes, working um, on consultation with tribes, um, because in the section or at least in the draft that I have that's given as a preference, um, there should be equal grounds and again, if these representatives are like as, um, des designated by the tribe, then there should not be any set policy here. That's up to the tribe to decide. And I understand that you might want to take that from the CalNACRA policy, but I don't think we are restricted to that. You, you have now the ability to make changes that are in benefit for the tribes. Right, and so the requirements that are reflected in the policy for the UC people also come from CalNagra. Mm -hmm. But I they could be. I hear what you're saying. But we they could be no amplified. There's no reason why we can't go beyond that. Beyond is that, that. what you're saying? So it is, yeah, and mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. So I guess that's my question: Can you go beyond CalNagra? Because as far as I understand, you, the UC we, can, we, yeah. right? We, you we don't we have to beyond. stick with this language. Okay. Right. Just as long as we're not. I think that's why she made the suggestion. If you can't change the language regarding their representatives, at least make it equal in terms of qualifications needed. If I could ask some additional questions yeah. about um, the, the committee membership. Um, I was wondering how um, will the NAHC solicit, um, uh, solicit uh, committee members? Um, and also uh, with regards to the renewable two-year term membership for voting members, um, is there going to be a term limit decided? And if not, um, how will the committee solicit new membership? Um, and also, is, um, uh, is the decision-making process um, going to be uh, made available to tribes with regard to how um, you know, if there are more no nominations um, than, than seats, you know, how, how is that decision going to be made? Okay. Those are. Hi, I'm the Executive Secretary of the NHC. Um, so as far as the nomination process, we would do that according to our consultation policy, but because this is a specific set of laws with a specific set of requirements, we're actually going to be considering um, how that nomination process will go in our next meeting in April. Um, so we'll post kind of a draft um, policy that will outline what we typically do under consultation anyway, which is typically we send out to all of the tribes on our list, we ask for nominations, we get letters of support, resolutions, things like that. Um, but we'll put it all in writing and then we'll have that available at least 10 days before the meeting, but we could probably do that a month before so that people have time to look at it and vet it and make sure it looks okay. Can you hear me? Uh, so we do have renewable two-year term limits um, to this, but it, we heard loud and clear from our work group that um, we don't want to every two years start over again, that there's some continuity that's, um, that is valuable to this process. So that's why we made it renewable terms rather than term limits. That was another um, suggestion that actually came from a UC member of staggering. I think that's what we can start currently now because we're not going to Haven't thought that through, but it's a, a chancellor decision or a president's decision, and um, we assume that we're going to have a good lot to pull from <laughs> with the nominations. Was there someone else queued up? Something new?
Can we wait for the mic, please? Thanks. There were a couple things, but one that um, uh, I recall uh, going back to the, the treatment of um, human remains. Let me see if I can uh, find the spot uh, where that's discussed. Um, but we um, also had the concern that um, any materials um, associated with the human remains and uh, funerary objects when they're being repatriated um, you know, in the form of just dirt that's, you know, held to those bones or any kind of residue, you know, protein residue, pollen, you know, whatever mineral residue, if those, um, if the language could be to be modified um, to include those as well, because obviously those, you know, uh, just in this, uh, being associated with either the funerary remains um, or the, the human remains also um, uh, hold significance to, to many tribes. But I guess that would be a, a written comment um, to be made. Um, I've got a bunch of other stuff that I have to like go through my paper. But. Great, thank you. Um, yes, we have received that. I, I thought I was it was in the matrix here somewhere, but um, um, I think it was Chairman McCarlin during one of our work group member meetings that suggested that um, all the packing materials that are with the human remains also be repatriated. So that is already in the policy, and I think it, that would be a perfect place to talk about the additional things that you want covered. I appreciate it. Maybe a little follow-up question. Would that also include images and other data, 3D images of any repatriated item? Will they be repatriated too? Hmm. Like 3D images and the photos? Right, so the, um, repatriation, I think, is the, right, the wrong word to use for that case because that's not a NAGPRA item, but, and it's something that we haven't um, discussed at great length, um, something that we need to take up with our Academic Senate as well. Um, but it is under consideration, and we have received that comment. Can, can you tell us what would be the value of that so we can understand? Well, obviously, NACPRA came into place before 3D imagery was established, so that's why it's not in the NACPRA language, um, I'm assuming. But um, we would be liking to see those like returned. I'm not sure how many institutions have used um, 3D imagery for human remains, but what I think the concern, at least for us, would be is, okay, we're having like all these human remains returned, but who guarantees us that we don't see a cast or a 3D image of the same skeleton like displayed in a museum, for example? Um, so I think these are concerns that why we would ask to have those things being returned to the tribes. So, so not just the information, but the actual original so that it would no longer be in circulation. Got it. Okay. That's why I was. Thanks. All right. And if it's not sim strictly thought of as being a repatriation effort, there's certainly a way to deaccession different things from the collections. Um, that's how Davis has proposed to resolve our dispute is to return the NAGPRA item since we're the only claimant, but then deaccession the other items. So um, that is an option though. I think many tribes would rather get back their remains and grave goods <coughs> through a recognition in the NAGPRA process versus an alternate process that, um, you know, might be available. I just wanted to follow up on the question about the 3D imaging. Um, I, I think the reference um, the provost made to the Academic Senate um, may not have fully explained what's going on under, under those circumstances. What we may be talking about, and I'm not sure, but what we may be talking about is um, you know, work product that faculty members think is their own, um, rather than something associated with the um, collection of the university. And I think that's what may render it somewhat more sensitive as far as returning it. 
um, especially if it's entirely um, the original and any capacity to make any further copies of it. So um, I think that's where we get into some um, maybe slightly more difficult or somewhat more difficult territory. Generally speaking, in the, in the University of California system, um, the, um, the published works of faculty um, are, belong to the faculty. And they may give up a copyright when they publish something, but in general, it's theirs. Um, when they create something that gets into the realm of patenting, it's a different story. And the university has claims on it that you know, much more complicate the situation. We have a vice chancellor for research right here who can uh, speak to this much more um, vividly than I could as a law professor. Um, but I think it's the, uh, the first part I was saying about the in intellectual work that is not patentable but is rather subject to copyright that um, the individual faculty member might start laying greater claim to. Um, uh, but it, it, did, did I translate? Well, okay. is, is the principle, at least the principle of what she's asking for clear though? There may be complications in doing it, but the principle of what she's asking for I hope is clear. Can we, can we go through, um, it's on page 36 to 37, um, this very lengthy access to human remains and funerary and sacred objects um, and the, the directive that, about testing and destructive analysis because it's very confusing and I'm not sure that um, I don't understand, I don't understand it, um, and I don't see it as a prohibition against destructive analysis and testing, which I think is what you know tribes were asking for. I see it that there's too many loopholes um, to allow that to occur. Um, so I'm just trying to get an understanding of how that works. Um, the, the paragraph in section four on um, page 36 starts, UC shall not permit research, destructive analysis, classroom use, or exhibition of human remains and or funerary objects of Native American or Native Hawaiian ancestors except as outlined below. Right. So number one is if... You don't have to read it. Okay. I'd like you to like, tell me, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So number one, if it's culturally affiliated, then it has to be, you have to have the permission of, the tri of that tribe, right? If, um, if, it's not culturally if it's not culturally affiliated, then you must go to all the tribes um, from whose land those remains or came from, Aboriginal and, and tribal lands. So in other words, I mean, it goes through these four sections, but the, the bottom line is that um, it, I think it's a very high standard. First, you know, from going to the tribe that has already a claim on it, then of course you, it's only with that tribe's permission. If it's culturally affiliated, you go with that tribe that has a cultural affiliation. If it's not culturally affiliated, then you go to all the tribes in the area that could potentially be culturally affiliated. So you can imagine if there's 20 tribes from that area, you're never going to get, I think, you know, 20 tribes to agree that there could be destructive analysis. So it's a very, it's purposely a very high bar. Um, but there are tribes, as I understand it, that would want a DNA testing. And if they're culturally affiliated, then they have the right to ask for that and to get it approved. So, so your read of the intent of that is that the object is not to do any of that testing unless you have permission. Exactly. But apparently that's not coming across clearly or cleanly. Okay. It, well, it's two pages long. Uh -huh. And it just, I, it, it just has language that I don't understand in terms of compliance with one through four above, notwithstanding, once a campus receives a claim, I mean, I don't, 
it's it's not user friendly. I don't right. think a tribal, uh, you know, cultural person, like it's it's, it's just it's not user friendly to right. understand what I would have to do to either, you know, m ensure that things don't get tested, or if I wanted that that to happen, what would I need to do? And I think part of what's I'm taken aback by this whole notion of if it culturally unidentifiable, find all the tribes in the aboriginal territory. Well, why not find them all to initiate a repatriation? Like, I mean, why would, you know, like, to have a testing, it just seems strange um, that there should just be okay. no testing, um, period, um, unless, you know, a tribe comes forth and says they want that. Like, the, and I think we're worried about academics internally taking that, uh, that step to do these things without anybody knowing. Lord, let me just try something. Yes. The objective isn't clear. That's what it sounds like to me. The procedure is, but not the objective. And, and if prefatory to all of that stuff, there was a statement, the intent is to repatriate. The intent is to avoid this. And the, avo the intent is that it would only be done with permission so you start with like, what's the objective? And then here's the procedures that we have for doing that. But sans those objectives, it's not clear from the procedures what, what, what you're really trying to do. Does okay. that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And, okay. and, and, and that just was straight, the intent, just, I want to say. That okay. was the intent. Uh, so we can, we can look at that. But what, um, I'm, what to, I want to, to say clarify. is I think that could be done other places. I, I'm, I'm just taking everything I've heard so far mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. And it's that, it's that fear that the intent and the objective is, is buried within the language of the procedure, and that would be better to know from a policy standpoint what the objective is. And maybe subject to interpretation. And, the, and then I think in this section you have woven in access. Like, it's all muddled, so I can't tell mm -hmm. what applies to access, what applies to testing, if access has to do with testing. And the access piece, um, I don't know that I completely understand either that the tribes are going to have easy access to, un to the collections or to understand what is there in terms of the collections. Okay. Mark? Yeah. Uh, um, I remember having this internal discussion. I don't remember it in detail. It's more of a sentiment that I remember. <laughs> it may have been late in the day and things were muddled. Um, the, uh, so. The statement should be that the, the policy is uh, testing is prohibited. So that's the rule. And we should be clear. That's the rule. Testing is prohibited, but exception. If a tribe actually requests uh, testing and other measures are taken and it's in, you know, meets certain circumstances, then the, an exception can yeah. be granted. But the, that has to be if, the tri if a tribe thinks it wants testing or demands testing or whatever. Yeah. But the rule, it should start from a real clear statement yeah. that uh, testing, in this case, is, is, is clear. And we, we, can, we, we can draft this in a much clearer way. Great. To, can I look Great. Like, I, yeah. to reflect um, the rule. I hear that. Thank you. Um, and the section on access by the tribes is, is one right before that, number three. And then number four is access for research purposes. Right, but um, number three is access oh, okay. by lineal, by lineal descendants, Native That's American tribes. Confusing. So, access. we'll try to clarify that. Okay. Thank you. I think in, in intention we're probably aligned. I'm thinking we are. I'm, that's because um, that is our intention with section four is to say to do what, as Chairman McCarrow just described, um, the prohibition except for. And that's what those one through four sections are supposed to do. So we can add clarity there. Let me just point out another piece of language in here because in all of these exemption, except as outlined below, this is where testing can happen. The way it's worded, and this is very, this is a very culturally, uh, this is a, a tribal perspective of this. It, it says the campus must obtain the explicit written position, permission from the cognizant Native American tribes 
or Native Hawaiian organizations. That's kind of offensive because one, it's saying that the campus can make an initiation to do testing. And I don't know if that's what Chairman McCarrow just said. It was if the tribes would want that. So this allows campuses to go find tribes to say yes and then do their study the way this is written. And, and then it's also, I don't know what cognizant tribes means. I don't know what that means. That's kind of strange. Um, but that kind of language, it turns it, it doesn't, it's not, it, it's not rooted in what we're really saying is that this should only happen at the tribe's request. If you're really saying UC does not engage in testing, they will not engage in testing, then they don't get, the campuses don't get to obtain explicit permission from tribes. The tribes would come to the campus and say, we want these items to be tested. Do, do, you, do you see the difference there? I, I think it's a she, huge difference. I think what she's saying is it appears that the language allows the campus to initiate no, no, it. I, I, I see okay. The but I don't understand why it's a problem that the university, uh, I, I okay. can see a researcher who comes into some, some remain, truly wants to help out with um, uh, 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 um, helping to identify these remains, recognizes the strictures on that process, and so seeks information, seeks uh, permission from those who might be affected about it. Well, I don't know what, well, I'm that's trying to understand the problem with that. That's cutting into the original intention of the UC saying, the UC shall not permit research, destructive analysis, classroom use, or exhibition of human, re human remains and funerary and sacred objects. That's, that's cutting into that. That's saying we don't, yeah, we're not gonna do it, but if you have a good reason to, you see academic person will let you if you get the permission of the tribes. It's, it's, a, it's a rub. It's a, it's a saying that you're not really committed to not permitting the research and the testing because you have all these exemptions for allowing it that aren't tribally driven. They're university driven. Okay. So that is the rub where the university is saying, no, we're not going to do this, but yeah, we're going to let people make requests to do it. Okay, can I get a researcher just for a moment perhaps to respond to this because what I what I thought I heard you trying to postulate although we couldn't think of an example is an example where even though because of the knowledge that a researcher has about something that's in the collection and hasn't been repatriated actually has a beneficial reason to do this that's beneficial to the tribes as opposed to just because I want to research it so so I want to turn to people who've done research is, is, it, is, the, is, the, is, there no, is there no such postulation possible, in which case there's no need for that? Yeah, can we get the, who's got the mic? Sorry. And, and I'm not saying I'm not okay with that. I'm just saying, what are we trying to say here? So I'm going to provide the detail of the discussion that the committee had, and it's just that if a tribe, this, and so I think we need to change it. Um, if a tribe is working with a researcher and they want to do research, then that, our whole intent is no research whatsoever unless exactly what you said, the tribe is initiating it. Okay. We had discussions within the committee that, that that's what we wanted to see. And so if it's not being reflected in the wording, I think we need to change it because that's exactly it. Is that, okay. yeah, that it's, that we want it, we, we don't want to do it, we, I'm not part of the UC, that we recommended that research not be done, but if the tribe wanted it to be done because of X, Y, and Z, that's their prerogative as long as they're affiliated with those remains. So okay. my suggestion would be exactly what Laura's pointing out. That really helped clarify it. Thank you. All right. What else do we want to move on to? I have an easy one. <laughs> Says you. We're kind of winding down, so I think I have an easy one. Um, I always like context. Um, I think that that always helps. So when I'm looking at the policy summary, which is, I guess, at the beginning here, um, maybe a brief history of how this policy update came to be. 
um, would be very beneficial, I think, um, instead of just kind of, you know, going right into here's the policy. I mean, we're all investing a lot into this. There's many factors that have brought this unprecedented, in the words of Lourdes and the provost, you know, kind of process together. I think that that should be acknowledged somewhere, um, you know, and, and how this process came to be. And maybe that becomes mm -hmm. another appendix, I hate to say it, but, or something, you know, if like it, it, it ends up having to be more than brief. Um, but I think that that context would be very useful. See, I told you it was easy. <laughs> um, we've talked, I think, pretty much today about things to change, things that could be better. Is there anything that you've seen so far in version two or in what's in green in the matrix that you want to say, yeah, please keep that. Don't, don't let somebody talk you out of that. We, we, that works from our point of view. Because what I heard was there were some things that went into version two that seemed to be going backwards from version one. We don't want to see things anywhere go back from what's in version two when we go to version three. So just I just thought I'd throw that out there since we are winding down. If there was anything that is an improvement that you would like to see retained, that's useful feedback too. And you might want to have more time to think. I oh, sorry. Let me get you the mic. From a historical perspective, um, you know, I think the, the radical shift that this policy represents from campus saying yes is the only thing that's appealable to campus <laughs> saying no is the only thing appealable is a huge shift in this policy. Um, <laughs> I would like to know it's, uh, so Carol, it might be in the committee section, is it? Yeah, think? it's, it's, yeah. The appeal or the... Hang on. No, hang no, on. Um, what it says, I, I don't, I don't know if it's in the process, in the inventory, I think it's in the committee section, but can't promise you <laughs> that, but um, the intention is that the committee's own, the system-wide committee, only reviews things that are like on appeal. So the system-wide committee no longer needs to review um, a campus decision to repatriate or to culturally affiliate. So we, we thought there's no use to rubber stamping that or to arguing it has, okay, has been the, to or to delay it in any way. So um, those decisions will go forward based on the campus um, decision. So I can. That is, that is a major, major yeah. and beneficial change. So don't go changing that. Don't so, so don't, <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. There's one. Don't change that. OK. We, we had set aside till 5. It's 4.30 right now. I do know in Berkeley we ended just a tad early. and. People took advantage of that to have other one-on-one -on -one conversations and clarifications. So it's really up to you whether we keep going um, or whether we break a little bit early and carry on conversations more on one. Mark. I, I don't know if we're winding down or not. I'm, I'm one of the worst at estimating when a meeting will end <laughs> after uh, participating in meetings. For two and a half decades. Um, but is there a representative, did I hear somewhere down here from, uh, was it the Yokuts or, or someplace, uh, Central Valley? Yeah. Oh, oh, okay. Darn it, okay. Well, I, for anybody that might catch us on live stream then, or have uh, uh, um, allies, partisans, or, or, or just uh, um, people they work with in, in, in the central part of the state, the, the Santa Barbara, session next week is, is intended to capture those from the central part of the state. So um, we could spread the word and, and help them, you know, encourage them to be there to, at the Santa Barbara session um, so that uh, you know, we can get uh, comments from, from, from them. Uh, and, and then, of course, they can also, anybody can go, of course, to the last one, which will be up at Davis. So, right. but uh, I, I wanted to get that out there before we uh, adjourned. Is there anything anybody forgot to say, wanted to say, hasn't said yet? 
Yeah, oh, good. Can you, you mind waiting, sorry. Just to uh, go back uh, regarding the discussion of uh, non-destructive uh, techniques, uh, does, you know, I don't have the document in front of me, but does the, uh, it, it, does, it, does it define what a non-destructive uh, um, is <laughs> in a document? Because I mean, well, what destructive and, is one of the two. And the reason I say that is because yeah. there is techniques to you know study you know remains or studying artifacts uh, that are non-destructive, and uh, you know as a, uh, when I was a student, I did a lot of those studies. So um, just wanted to point it out that you know there is. Uh, um, what would be an example like an X-ray? There is a or? yeah portable XRF. Um, that's okay. just uh, you know a tick. It's just like a. a small laser that just kind of extracts up to 60, 70 uh, chemical elements. So, and it's non-destructive. And so if, you know, uh, yeah, so, so that's just an example. So then um, you could grab, you know, as much information you need it. And then so, you know, being in the position where I am now, where, you know, I have archeologists asking me, hey, we want to do this on these artifacts. Um, you know, my first thing is, you know, uh, no. And so um, it's just, and the reason is because I don't know how that data is being used. You know, even with archaeologists and academics, you know, they might have good intentions of, you know, we want to work with tribes, but at the end, I don't know where, how that data is being used. And it's going to be reused, and somebody else is going to use it again. Mm. And so uh, at some point, it's, it's not, I don't think it's going to help the tribes. But Interesting. And, and it's, whether it's a definition of destructive or non-destructive or both, what I'm hearing is that people may have different understandings or yeah, connotations it's, it's of what that means. Yeah, with the uh, 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 discussion about you know, ambiguous terms. Yeah. And so this yeah. is just uh, something Thank you. there. I looked for a definition. I couldn't find a useful one for non-destructive analysis, actually. So if you have something to offer, um, I, we could discuss it. Hang on. Hang on. Sorry. The whole point is back to what Desiree is saying. That's why it's tribally driven with a researcher in conjunct. Like, it's not, because you can put a definition in there, but it's what the tribe's traditional practices, in yeah, in the particular circumstance. It's all factually based. So, yeah, we can put, but maybe there's a tribe that doesn't even like the process that you were talking about. I don't know. You know, it's just, it's going to be, that's why, the way that is worded is so important. It can't be campus driven. It can't be driven from the, the, the researchers. It's got to be driven by the tribes in conjunct with the researchers so they can define what's what. And I think what I heard him say is what if they were intending the campus doing something because they were under the belief that it was non destructive and yet it might be considered, yeah. I mean, there could be some confusion around that. And I think that the destructive nature is one aspect, but there's an intrusive nature. You know, yes. And one of the concerns yes. we have is okay. suddenly, so okay. because of this policy okay. happening, and suddenly there's going to be a lot of research and photographing of these remains that I'm just going to take it out of the human remains, even just an artifact. I mean, the point of view, an artifact has its own integrity and it, it, its own rights in a way, you know not even going to human remains and so concerns about what is being done not just with the data but how these objects are being treated because they're not just something that is you get data from they have other meanings from a tribal viewpoint and so destructive to me is is like uh, not the way to look at it we have to look at how these remains are being treated and also what education to the academics um, to the point of what is associated you know there's viewpoints of some Kuya people that um, anything that is touched, the box, you know, all that stuff needs to be repatriated. How is how are these materials, these 9,000 at Berkeley being treated, you know, and what needs to be repatriated? So it really, focusing on destructive, I don't think is really the way that it's the mm. respect for these mm. art, these these people um, today. I just, one other comment, I, you know, I would really like to see a session like this down in the San Diego area. Um, I think there's more up north and in central, and, all due respect to Santa Barbara, I used to live there. It's, it's an out-of-the-way place, and, and when I've been, done other meetings like this, it's not really that well attended. And so um, I do think we should have another one in Southern California to reach people farther farther south. Okay. I was just going to give a reference to Lourdes. Um, Lourdes, in, 
and, and you'll know this because TIPOs deal with this all the time, but in federal and in state law, it's culturally appropriate treatment. And in the human remains law, it's, um, it's appropriate dignity, and that's culturally appropriate dignity. So those are the benchmarks, and those already exist as sort of tenants that tribal uh, folks that work in cultural resources and in this world are very familiar with, and even that archaeologists and, and folks that are in those worlds should be very familiar with it. And again, it's from the perspective of the tribe the, the, that um, how they define what's culturally appropriate treatment. Maybe we're done just for today. Obviously, we're not done, but done for today in terms of had a lot shared today. I, I do hope you agree people were speaking from the heart today. Um, this is more to come. We're only really even halfway through these sessions, let alone the whole rest of the process. So um, thank you so much for everything everyone has offered today. And I, I think you all tried really hard to live up to the prayer that was offered in terms of respect and understanding, so um, great. Anyone from UC want to say anything or anyone else in closing? I'm just thankful for all that people have offered and um, volunteered and shared and, uh, um, uh, and uh, this doesn't have to be, I think Chairman McCarl said it earlier, this doesn't have to be the only um, a way to, to communicate what you might have for us. So um, I hope you, um, even those live streaming, I hope they make use of the other avenues of communication and, um, uh, and let's keep the, the engagement going. Right. And you'll be, you see people, you're gonna stick around, right, for a little while? Yes. Yeah, okay. All right, thank you, everybody. Thank you.